All right, good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing? Alive and awake at this lovely 8.30 in the morning. Uh, make sure that y'all grab some coffee or uh, breakfast um, and feel free to get up and do that during the presentation if you need to. Um, my name is Andrew Goodman. I am the engineering manager for IPRC and today we're gonna be talking about the legacy updates as well as we have a few other presenters that have, are gonna give some added detail. So back here we have Tablisha Taylor, uh, we have Melissa Harris, and then Jose Mendez is right there, right behind us, okay. Um, so before we get started, you know, thank you for everybody that's here in person and virtually. Uh, just a note to the virtual, uh, we do not have the capacity right now to be monitoring the chat. So if there's any questions that pop up on the chat, uh, just make sure that you email them to me. We'll make sure you get any of your questions answered. Um, for everybody here, um, if we look at the agenda, we're going to have a few breaks. Um, during those breaks, that's time to get up, do what you need to do, but it's also going to be the time to ask questions. So uh, we ask for you know time constraints that y'all just hold questions until we get to that point. Make sure you're jotting them down, um, but we will be taking questions there. And then at the end, we're going to have a big Q&A with all the panel. So if y'all have any questions for anybody, that's a great time to ask. Uh, so starting off, we're going to talk about what has changed while we're going back to this. Yes. Oh, DJ, yes, sorry, you snuck in on me. Hey, no, I did. Uh, before we get started, our uh, director is going to give us a little message. <laughs> no, I, I didn't want to interrupt the, the good training that you guys are doing, but I wanted to say thank you guys for coming and participating with us today. Super, super excited about, you know, the things that these guys are going to present today. We're finally able to go back to the legacy process. Those of you who have worked with us a while, you know about the old days, uh, how it was sluggish trying to get a thing through IPRC and CFA and construction. Um, and then we did a Lean Six Sigma back in 20, what was it, 2018, uh, which we decreased the time, like we cut it in like a, a, in half about. Um, and then the legislator came out with the shot clock bill, which actually slowed us down. So finally they've taken the shot clock off of IPRC plans, and now we're able to go back to that legacy process um, and from 2018 that allowed us to get plans through IPRC in about 52 days. So, you know, that's really good. I think they're going to also talk to you guys about some other improvement we have in other areas, you know, um, the in-house design uh, function that Vic and his team has been working on. So again, uh, it's a great day to be working in the city of Fort Worth, and I hope you guys enjoy this training and you share with your colleagues. Thanks so much for coming. All right, thanks everyone. Um, so again, uh, for going back to our agenda, we're gonna talk about what has changed. Uh, DJ's kind of precursor that, so we're gonna kind of dive into that a little more in depth. We're gonna talk about the legacy process. We're gonna talk about that previous version that he was talking about as well as some revisions we've made. You know, not everything that we implemented during House Bill was bad. Um, so we wanted to keep the good parts and trim down the, the fat, as they say. Um, so then we're gonna go over the process overview, look at that process map, um, and then also those review times. And then we're gonna talk about the rollout. So I think everybody wants to know when everything's happening. So we've got a whole calendar with all of those important dates. Um, then we're going to take a break, time for QA, and a and then when we come back, we're going to have Tablisha talking through the Acela ACA and the application updates. She's also going to talk about the ACA payments and how payments can be made for those reviews. Uh, then Jose is going to talk about that technical review that he does during pre-submittal, explain what he's looking for, what uh, he's going to be making comments on um, for the technical review. Uh, then we're going to take another break, and then we're going to have Melissa come up and talk about the water department cost participation projects, uh, when they're used, what's the benefits, uh, going through change orders and public bid, um, and then finally the reimbursement, how that money actually gets reimbursed. And then I'm going to finish us out with just some CFA updates and overviews. That's going to be super simple. There's just one minor change to the CFA exhibits, but we're going to do a quick review uh, over those exhibits as well as the phase in concurrent, because um, that's something we get lots of questions about. 
Uh, and then we're going to just talk about some other updates, things that we see on the horizon we just want to familiarize y'all with. Uh, nothing that's happening right now, but, you know, giving y'all that information as quick as we can. And then finally, we're going to do that Q&A. Do we have any questions before we get rolling here? Awesome. All right. So what has changed? So I think everyone knows House Bill 3167. Uh, lovingly gave us the shot clock that I know everyone was super excited about. Um, House Bill 3160, uh, 3699 came through last year, uh, review, uh, removed plan review from that process. So we no longer have to be under the shot clock. Platting still stays underneath the shot clock. So that's something that's still around for platting, um, but it allowed us to go back to that legacy process. And as DJ mentioned, um, there was a lot of work done to build that legacy back in the day. We actually got the days down to a pretty good flow. Then House Bill 3167 came in, modified things. So now, you know, based on discussions we've had with many people in this room, as well as internal, we've decided going back to legacy is the best option for us. Uh, so looking at the previous legacy process, so we start out with mandatory pre-submittal meetings. Uh, first reviews were the construction plans, project manuals, and the CFA exhibits. Compliance reviews had the revised construction plans, project manuals, CFA exhibits. Um, then we would route the cover sheet for signatures back in the day that was bringing a big old mylar in and having everybody sign off on it. Um, we had the execution of the CFA electronic documentation package, which is pretty similar to what we have under House Bill. So you had the final project manual any easements by separate instruments, uh, permits, bid proposal tool. Uh, then the construction fund accounts would be set up so that the inspectors could get paid from those fees that were collected. Uh, and then we'd go to a pre-construction meeting. If we look at the revised, it does not look significantly different. So we're going back to those mandatory pre-submittal meetings. Uh, for during first review, though, we're going to just do construction plans only this round. This is something that we implemented under House Bill. We, we saw that it works because at this point, this is when we have most of your studies in. This is really when we're getting a full idea of what's going on, but there's still going to be comments. So we don't want uh, consulting engineers wasting time on project manuals and CFA exhibits that they're going to turn around and change all over again. So. You know, we're putting all the focus on the construction plans for that first review. Coming into compliance, so those compliances are going to have the revised construction plans, the project manual, and the CFA exhibit. So we're not going to have that IPRC documentation package. There's going to be that compliance review. We're going to have a precursor on the, the IPRC documentation package is not fully going away. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. So we have cover sheets. Those are still going to be routed electronically, but we're going to do everything through Acela, get rid of the emails going back and forth. That should save some time on the back and forth between the PM and our consulting engineers. Again, something from COVID that was a positive is us moving to a lot of electronic documentation. Uh, so we're going to keep that implemented as we move forward. So then we have the CFA preparation package. This is just a fancy word to say those final CFA exhibits and the signed bid proposal by the contractor. Once that's taken in, we're going to move to the execution of the CFA. That's when the CFA financial guarantee is paid, as well as those material and uh, inspection fees. And so what we've done is we've actually moved up the construction fund accounts here. So we've added a step in the workflow so we're notified when those fees are paid. That's going to allow us to move the money over to construction services earlier and reduce any kind of admin time that may hold up going to pre-con. We don't want us to be the holdup for y'all getting to pre-con. Um, so then we're going to have the electronic documentation package review. That's going to have the project manual, easements, permits, bid proposal. What we've also added here is the SDS pre-construction review. So back, you know, previously, we had the electronic documentation. Then it go to SDS. They're not doing another review of the plans. What they were looking at was, was your SWIFTMA taken care of? Was your floodplain permits, your grading permits, making sure anything that needed to be taken care of before construction was actually taken care of? 
So that's going to continue, but there's no reason they can't be looking at that while your PM is looking at your electronic documentation. So we've just combined those at the same time. So they're going to run parallel of each other, again, reducing that step to pre-con. Uh, we've also added a SWIP submittal review, which we'll talk about on the next slide here. Um, and then we move to that pre-construction meeting, what everybody wants to get to. So just kind of diving into those process changes. So now that we have mandatory pre-submittals, we're going to make sure that the CPN, FID, file, and X numbers are provided to you as part of pre-submittal. That's going to make sure that your pre-submittals match up to your first reviews. You're going to get all of your uh, numbers. So when you come back in, it's a lot easier for you to actually apply for those applications. Uh, we've added environmental services uh, to the review process. This is because this is a brand new department. So we wanted to make sure that we gave them an opportunity to review. Uh, again, they're also going to be looking at that SWIP at the end. Um, so another change is the recorded or accepted for review final plat with final plat number must be included in the construction plan. So no more horizontal control plans. Now that we've been separated from plat, you know, previously we were on the 3167 together. We're separating, we're going back to uh, previous legacy, which was having that final plat submitted and uh, accepted for review. So we got to make sure that that happens, and we're asking for that at the pre-submittal review. <clears throat> uh, alignment walk requests will be identified during the pre-submittal review and must be completed prior to submitting your first review. This does not mean you can't go out, get, you know, if you know you need an alignment walk, reach out to development services water section, get that set up, have your alignment ready to go for pre-submittal. Honestly, highly recommend that. I recommend having all your studies at pre-submittal. That means you're going to have a more comprehensive pre-submittal and we're going to get to you better comments. But if, if you have a project and you're not sure that it needs to have an alignment walk for water or sewer, or you know, you, you're trying to get everything in, pre-submittal is we're going to allow that opportunity for uh, development services water section to actually relay if an alignment walk is needed during that time. And then at first review, we're going to hold you from coming to first review until you've taken care of those alignment walks. Uh, submittal day for reviews will be on Mondays and not Tuesdays. So this is not a change from House Bill 3167. I think everybody is familiar with Monday first reviews. Um, what, it is a change from legacy, and the reason we're doing it is right now we're going to have those pre-submittals coming in but we're not getting rid of our express CFAs. So we're gonna have express CFAs and pre-submittals coming in on Tuesday. We do not wanna overload our uh, coordinator and our engineering tech. So we're gonna keep first reviews on Monday, but we've extended that deadline to close of business. So you have until close of business on Mondays to get those first reviews in. And we'll go through all the timings, how everything is shortly here. This is just kind of a brief overview of the process changes. We're going to recommend that urban forestry permit be submitted before your first review. This is a component of your final plat, so more than likely you've already done this step. We're just adding that recommendation so that it's at the forefront when you're thinking about coming in and what all the steps that you have to meet. We want it to remind you that urban forestry is an important step. Um, let's see here. So SDS uh, permit review and the SWIP submittal review will be incorporated into the electronic documentation package. So again, SDS is going to be reviewing during our electronic documentation package. They're going to be looking at those floodplain permits and those grading permits because SWIFMAs are actually a requirement of your final plat. So they're going to be checking that a lot earlier in the step. Um, and then so for the SWIP submittal reviews, before you go to construction, I think everybody knows that you got to have a SWIP in place. Everyone's prepared for that. Uh, it came to our attention from the, our environmental services that they just weren't getting the data that they needed to know that those submittals were taken care of. And so we're adding them into a review, make sure they know that these developments are going in. That keeps us in compliance with the city's MS4 permit. So this is just an added review um, that's happening during the electronic documentation package. Uh, and then finally here, there's just a note. So any projects that are under House Bill 3167 will continue the process of House Bill 3167. We're not going to do any hybrids. 
So there's a calendar already out on our website at the top. It kind of goes through the next few months of House Bill 3167. On the bottom is the legacy that we're rolling out uh, next week. So, uh, you know, that we just want to make sure everybody understands. We, we don't have the capacity to do those hybrids. So anything that's under House Bill stays under House Bill. <clears throat> so looking at the process a little deeper. So in pre-submittals, Pre-submittal reviews and conferences are going to be mandatory. They will still have that $1,000 fee uh, to come in. So make sure that everyone's aware of that. Uh, but pre-submittal conferences will be 30 minutes long and held virtually unless in-person is requested. So previously in their House bill, we had conferences from 1 to 5. And it was an hour long, which meant we could get four conferences in in one day. Now, we want to make sure since they're mandatory, we can get more in. We're cutting that to 30 minutes. So it's still going to run 1 to 5 on Thursdays, but they're going to be 30 minutes long. And what we're going to be doing is anybody, so you'll have the option to have in-person or virtual. If you choose in-person, those are going to be set up between 1 and 3. If you choose virtual, it's going to be 3 to 5. If, you, if we have more virtuals than we have in person, we'll take some of the time from the in-persons and move a virtual there. But we can't add more in-persons because we have to be cognizant of our PRT members' abilities to travel back and forth and be at their desk at those times. So if we have more than uh, four requests in person, that fifth person will have the opportunity to either switch that to remote or be moved to first in line the next week for that in person. So we can have more virtual, we can't have more in person. Um, the other request we have is these are going to be 30 minute long meetings. Uh, comments are going to get provided to you at two o'clock on Tuesday before that meeting, similar to what we have right now. We ask y'all take the time on Tuesday and Wednesday, go through those comments. And then when you come to that conference, be ready to ask those questions, pull up any um, Clarity items that you need to ask, uh, be able to share your screens virtually or in person. You can, will have the capacity to share screens there. Or if you want to bring in um, your actual plans, that's fine too. But we're going to have 30 minutes. We want to make sure we get you your answers. So for us to do that, we need y'all to come in prepared, ready to ask those. Um, and then just a note. Uh, so let's see here. Yeah, so record and accept it for review final plot must be provided in the construction plans. We talked about that already. Uh, and then if fees are not paid by the time city comments are due, comments will not be released in the consult the uh, consultant or will not be released to you. And the conference is going to be moved to the next week. Now, you go to the end of the line. So if we have eight people, you may get bumped again. So it's important to make sure those fees get paid on time. First reviews. So first reviews are going to be weekly submissions. So every Monday you can come in for a first review till 5 p.m. So that is a change from our house bill where we had the bi-weeklies. Um, some other changes. So study numbers will be required. I think everybody knows study letters are no longer required. Everyone's excited. We're excited about that. Um, but what we're going to have is when you come into your application, you're actually going to provide your study numbers to us. And by doing that, it's going to leak those studies directly to the IPRC record. So we'll have the ability to see where y'all are in review, make sure that they've been approved. If there were revisions in between reviews, we'll know that those revisions have been made. So we can do everything on our side so we don't need those letters to say that y'all done what you needed to do to come in. Submission days will stay on Monday, but be accepted to 5 p.m. Again, I think we talked about that already. And it's going to be a 14-day review, same that we have right now. But previously under House Bill 3167, we had to have extra days built in in case we went to uh, City Plan Commission. That was a component of the House Bill 3167. Since that is now removed, 14 days will be both your comments and your decision letter for first reviews. So in 14 days, you will get your comments and you will get a decision letter. Um, <clears throat> so to come in, all studies must be approved except for the drainage study, which must be submitted seven calendar days before the first review. This is how it was back uh, when Legacy was implemented. 
So just understand, you go through your pre-submittal, a week before you're coming in for your first review, you've got to have that drainage study in and submit it, or you're not going to be accepted that week. Um, and then there's the addition of the IPRC documentation package workflow if plans are accepted. So again, it's going away for the most part because all of those documents are getting reviewed in compliance. But let's say in all of the excitement, you get approved your first review, that's awesome. We got to do a quick check to make sure you have your draft uh, project manual and your quantity takeoff and your easement. So we're going to have that added step if you get approval during your first review. So compliance, I think this is going to be our biggest change from House Bill. So compliances are going to, submissions are going to be any time, any day, any time. With that said, if you want to submit on a Saturday at 11 p.m., I applaud your diligence for working late on a weekend. Our PMs will not be working at 11 p.m. on Saturday. So they're going to not look at it until Monday. But they can come in at any time. So when you're ready, we're all good to go. There are no more R folders. So we're not going to have the situation of having to come in with a new application, creating this R folder, not knowing, do I put the plans here? Do I put the waivers here? Just getting rid of all of that. Everything's going to go under the parent IPRC folder. And what we're having set up is now when you add documents in, and there still will be virtual folders, so you got to follow those virtual folders similar to what we do right now. But when you put those documents in, it's actually going to notify your PM there's something to review. So instead of having that compliance application, you're just going to put it into the uh, parent folder, and it will notify your PM that there's something to review. All studies must be approved, including any revisions required in the previous versions. This goes for alignment walks as well. So studies and alignment walks, everything's got to be approved to come in for compliance. All LONOs, permits, waivers, and other items that would bar approval need to be provided and approved at that time. So if you have a TxDOT permit that you need, you can't come to compliance without that TxDOT accepted. If you uh, need a LONO, we need to make sure those LONOs are there. I know no one likes LONOs. That's, we still got to have them when we're crossing into someone else's easement. Um, you know, waivers. So if there was a waiver request, those can be submitted out of cycle. We do not have to have them in cycle like we did under House Bill. So we want to make sure you're taking care of those, having those conversations outside. Everything needs to be submitted to come in for compliance. And the way that we're going to monitor that <clears throat> is the, per, uh, the PM is going to take 24 hours. So once those projects come in, again, on a city day, I applaud your diligence if you're working weekends. PMs are going to work on Monday. Um, they're going to look at it on, for 24 hours, and they're going to go through a technical review, very similar to what Jose is going to talk about for the pre mill. And they're going to look and make sure, have you done all your revisions? Are your comments all addressed? Um, do you, if you needed LONOs, have those been taken care of? If you need to revise your studies, have you gone and done that? They're going to go through all of that, and they got 24 hours. And then what they're going to do is, if you're approved, they're going to move you into compliance. If not, they're going to reject you, and they're going to give you a full list of items that you need to correct to be allowed to come into compliance. So there's not going to be a back and forth of, oh, well, I missed this, oh, I missed this. They're going to give you a full list. Once you get that list, you're going to be accepted for that compliance review. Um, but again, if you're denied, you're going to get your list. You don't have to wait two weeks like you do right now. You get everything taken care of in a couple of days, reapply. It's all good. You know, we're not, we're not dealing with the submittal days where it makes it more of a challenge to come in. Um, so submissions will include the plans, the CFA exhibits, the draft project manual, the quantity takeoff matrix, and on the draft project manual, we need to make sure that the working days are provided. If the working days aren't provided, you're not going to be accepted for compliance because this is when we're going to be doing those fees for the inspection and uh, administrative material testing. <clears throat> we're going to have a 14-day calendar review for the first compliance. So this is an additional seven days than what we have under House Bill, but we also are looking at 
a lot more documents at this point to review. So we're taking 14 days, make sure we're doing a really good review. Um, and then on 14 days, comments will be provided back. So on the 14th day, you will get comments. Seven days for any R2s, R3s. Hopefully we don't have a lot of those. That's the whole point of us doing that review. We're trying to get you in for one compliance review and then moving on. Um, so seven calendar days if we have to move to a second or third. Um, and then, so from that, uh, we're, so if you have approval after 14, let's talk first compliance. If you have approval first compliance, that's great. Um, you're gonna get a decision letter on the 14th day. If you, uh, if you have a disapproval after 14 days, you're also gonna get a decision letter on the 14th day. But what we've done, because as we know, a lot of times you get yours back and there's very small comments, but because there's comments, we can't give approval. We've added an additional seven day option period for you to work with your PMs and the PRT members to get approval. So again, if you have approval before we go into that option period, there's no reason for you to have an option period. You're gonna get your decision letter. If there are comments that just can't be addressed in seven, there was a revision that just wasn't met or the study's gotta be changed, something significantly like that, we're gonna give you a, a disapproval because you know we're not gonna be able to make that time. You're gonna get a condition our uh, corrections required if that seven day option period allows for you to go in and fix those minimal comments that are left. All right. Um, so review will be performed by the PM unless PRT members request or the at the PM's request. So reasons the PM request will maybe be revised uh, calculations or revised studies, things like that. So they will bring in the PRT members that have either request for that review or that they need to have that additional review time. But the PMs are going to be doing the full review for compliances. They are in charge of the compliances review. Um, so no post-submittal meetings going forward. We've got eight pre-submittals happening every Thursday. At the same time, we're running four Express CFA projects. We just don't have the capacity to keep those post-submittal meetings. That being said, again, between first at review and compliance, we expect you to be working with your PM. We expect that PM to be setting up any meetings you need with the PRT members and getting those comments addressed before you come back into compliance. So that doesn't mean just because there's not a formal post-submittal meeting, you, you just can't talk to your PM or your PRT members. We expect that to be happening and getting those waivers approved and all of that. Um, and finally, there's no conditional approval going forward. During House Bill 3167, we would do a conditional approval when we were pending a permit or a LONO uh, to just get you moving forward to the IPRC documentation package. But there isn't an IPRC documentation package and you're supposed to have all your LONOs and stuff before you come into compliance. So there's really no need for a conditional approval anymore. So looking at post plan uh, approval, so no changes to the cover sheets or the CFA preparation items. So again, cover sheets gonna all be electronic. CFA preparation, fancy word for those final, um, final CFA exhibits and the signed bid form. Um, so we'll kind of talk through what we're gonna look at at each one of those items. Um, but construction office fund accounts have been moved up after the fees have been paid, again, this, you're not going to see any change on your side. On ours, it just makes sure that we're not going to hold you up from electronic documentation to go into pre-con. SDS pre-construction review has been changed to construction permit acceptance. Just as a reminder, they are not re-looking at your plans. They're just checking to make sure that the permits that are required for constructions have been completed. Uh, and then SWIT submittal review has been added for uh, environmental services. So we're gonna go over this super easy to read, very simple process flow of the legacy. Um, so let's dive in here. So I know this is very small. I apologize, there was not a good way to get this presented to you today, but y'all will have the slides and it will be recorded. So pre-submittals will come in on Tuesdays, just like they have. 
uh, for all of House Bill 3167. We will need your um, submissions by 12 p.m. on Tuesday. The reason for this is we have to get these out to the PRT members and the PMs to review on Tuesday. So we've got to make sure that we have all of the reviews taken care of and get those out. Um, so again, Jose is going to be looking at a technical review during pre-submittal. He's going to give you all, all the details on what he looks at and what he dives in on those. But once you get past that, you're going to have to pay your $1,000 fee, and then you're going to have a pre-submittal conference scheduled. Again, 8 on Thursdays, 1 to 5. And you're going to have in-person from 1 to 3 if you so choose. 3 to 5 is set for virtual only. Um, we're going to have seven days to review and provide comments. So again, Tuesday to Tuesday is when the PRT members and the PM are reviewing. Tuesday by 2 p.m., you will have comments uploaded to Acela, and you will get a notification saying comments have been uploaded. Um, take that time. Make sure you won't know which comments you really need to address. There may be some super simple ones that you don't need to ask, and then there may be some really complex things you really want to know about. Make sure you come to that pre, um, pre-submittal conference meeting ready to have those discussions. Again, we're going to ask you to be able to share screens, um, virtually share screens in person. You can share screens, or if you want to print out your plans, that's perfectly fine, too. We'll have a table, everything ready. Um, in the meantime, while we're at the current city hall, uh, we're going to be moving our in-person pre-submittals to our planning conference room, which is over here on the left. Um, that is because it gives that capacity to screen share a lot easier than the TPW one, which we were at previous. Um, once we move to City Hall, we or new City Hall, I should say, uh, we'll have to see what is available, and we'll give the, uh, whichever conference room, room is available at that time. So... Uh, again, Thursday, you're going to have your conference. Everything looks good. You'll be ready for your first review. To come into your first review, remember, all studies have to be applied for, except, or accepted and approved. Your drainage study has to be applied for when? There we go, seven calendar days before. So remember, Mondays is when first reviews come in. The previous Monday, you've got to have that drainage study in. Uh, so you've had your pre-submittal, you've done all your studies, you've done your alignment walks if one was called for it, um, and you've submitted your drainage study, everything looks good, you're coming in for first review. This review that we have to make sure you're accepted, this is not a full technical review like we had during pre-submittal, this is administrative. Do you have all the components that are necessary to come in? Have you, do you have all your studies, what we just talked about? We're not diving into the weeds for this first review because that's why we have all the PMs and the PRT members looking at it. Um, again, construction plans only. We are likely to have comments. Uh, I got the data from when we had Legacy before, and in that time, we had one project that got approval during first reviews. So we're not expecting everybody to be able to come through first review and get approvals. We'd love to see that happen, and maybe we can update if we see everybody coming in and getting everything done. Um, but in the meantime, construction plans only. That's what we want the focus of the plan, first, plan review, or first plan review to be. Um, so that administrative review is going to be one day, turn around uh, on Mondays. Now, if you come in past three, they may be reviewed Tuesday morning, and Tablish is going to talk a little bit about the, that submittal process. Once it comes in, we're going to have 14 days to review. So the, all the, P, the PM and all the PRT members will review first review. And we'll have 14 days to review that and get you a, uh, the comments and a decision letter. So again, 14 days, comments, and decision letter. At this time, you can apply for your CFA application. That is something that is open to you on the first review. Um, you don't have to do it now. You just got to make sure you do it before you get to the uh, CFA financial guarantee because they will need that in the contract management office. Uh, so once you have a decision letter, if you get approved, exciting. We'll go over the IPRC documentation package that we need. If not, that's okay. We got the review, uh, the compliance review process for you. 
So looking at the IPRC document review, so what we're going to need here is the CFA exhibits, the draft project manual, easements, permits. Typically, this is easements by separate instruments. I think everybody's familiar with those. The quantity takeoff matrix, um, and then let's see, am I missing anything there? Oh, draft project manual. So draft project manual, remember, we've got to have working days. If you don't have working days, it's going to be denied to come in because we need those to set up the fees. So once we come in, we're going to have five days to review all of that. Uh, in those five days, so if you have uh, easements by separate instruments, well, we're going to ask your initiation form, your exhibits, but we're also going to ask you to upload your closure reports, signature authority, everything that you would typically have provided to the land agent in the contract management office. The PM is going to review that initiation form and those exhibits, make sure that everything matches the approved plans. And once they trigger in their workflow that a easement by separate instrument is needed, it's going to create this EIPRC record. And it's going to directly notify that land agent that there is something for them to review. This is to cut down on the emails back and forth, and there's been times where not all the data is getting to the land agent, or the PM's not getting notified first that you know there's an easement by separate instrument that needs to be reviewed. To save time, make sure everything is going through a CELA. We've actually set it to automate this EIPRC record, notify that land agent that there's something to review. Uh, at the same time, the material and inspection fee worksheet is created based on those working days. Um, so once we have that complete, we move to the approval. Uh, if, if it's approved, it goes to cover sheet. If not, we go through this. OK, yeah, if everybody that's on the call, please make sure that your mics are muted. Um, it's, we're getting some background up, up here. Thank you. Um, all right. Moving to compliance. So again, compliance review. If you don't make it through the first review and you got comments, this is the time where we're going to be asked, asking for all of those loaners to be taken care of. Your text up permits have been taken care of. Any revisions to your studies and that drainage study approval have to happen before you come into that compliance review. So on top of that, we're going to have our construction plans. We're going to have our um, comments from the first review. And we're going to have our draft project manual with our working days, our easements, exhibits, and permits, quantity takeoff matrix, and the CFA exhibits. The PM is going to take 24 hours on city days to review that and give you a technical review. Make sure that all of the items that are required for you to come in have been provided, as well as you've answered those comments that were provided to you. We're trying not to have repeat comments. We're trying to cut down on, on our side, we're trying to cut down on second bite of the apple, get rid of those. But on your side, we also need to make sure that every comment is being addressed, not just acknowledged. So make sure you're noting how you address that comment. They're going to review that. If it's denied, it's going to be sent back with a full list. Here's what you need to do to be accepted. Again, you can apply anytime, any day. You get it corrected in a couple of days, you come back in. No big. If you get approved, that's great. We're going to take first review. We're going to take 14 days for that review. Again, we're going to have that EIPRC record created if there are easements by separate instruments. We're going to have that material and inspection fee um, worksheet created with those working days provided. Uh, once those reviews are done on the 14th day, you will get comments. On the 14th day, if you have approval, you'll also get a decision letter. If you have a disapproval, you'll get a decision letter. If you get corrections required, that means there's minimal comments that need to be addressed. It's going to open that seven-day option period for you to work with the PN, the PRT members, and get approval. Uh, so from there, everything looks good. We're going to move to signing that cover sheet. So again, 14 days plus the seven-day option period for the first compliance review. Every compliance review after is going to be a seven-day review with the possible seven-day option period. So if we look at the cover sheets, these are going to go through Acela. Again, we're trying to cut down on the emails. Emails get lost. 
we all know how many emails y'all get in a day. You can imagine we get about the same coming into us. We don't want those getting buried. So make sure those cover sheets go to Acela. Any, any documents that go to Acela is going to notify that PM that there's something to review. So it's going to be important to choose the right virtual folder and to be providing it into the right parent folder. Uh, so once that's submitted to us, we're going to have two days, make sure everything looks good and get the PM signature and my signature and get that back to you. Then we're going to go to the CFA preparation package. We're going to look at those final CFA exhibits. What we're looking for here, because we've already looked at them during compliance, we're making sure, let's say you had that option period and you needed to make some very minor modifications. Did you need to modify the CFA exhibits? Did those get modified? We're just checking to make sure that they're matching that approved plan set. Uh, and then the bid proposal with the contractor signature, during that draft project manual, we're going to ask that you provide all the items and the amount of those items based on your plans. So we will have reviewed and told you, okay, you're missing restorative seed inside. I think everybody's had that comment once in their life. Um, so we're going to have told you that. At this point, we're looking at unit times unit price equals the cost. I really request everyone in here, when a contractor sends you one of these, you're checking that unit times unit cost equals total. The, we've had rounding errors, and it hurts everybody when we have to do a change order for five cents especially when we have a cost participation project and we have to get nine signatures within the city to those. So we don't want to hold up your green sheet for five cents. We're going to be checking here. We ask that y'all check it before y'all come in as well. Um, so two days to get everything reviewed. At that point, we're going to go to the CFA preparation package out. You're going to get notified everything's been accepted. And you're going to be going to the contract management office to get that CFA executed. Uh, you can see our little teal line coming down here. So if you remember, that was the CFA application. So at this point, that application's got to be in. Those fees got to be paid. At uh, the CFA financial guarantee, you're going to be choosing whichever financial guarantee works best for your project, as well as paying those inspection fees. Once that has been paid, you can see we'll have a split. So we're going to have the CFA routing. That's when they're going to get you that draft. They're going to get you all those signatures. Everything's going. On our side, we're going to be able to move that money over to the construction services and make sure we're not a hold up at the end. Once that's all taken care of, we're going to come in for that electronic documentation package. As you can see, I kind of forked it here so you see everything that's under. It's going to be called the electronic documentation package when you see it in the workflow. I just wanted to again call out that SDS's review and the SWIP review is at the same time as our electronic documentation package. So you're going to come in with your fully executed project manual. You're going to have picked who your uh, testing firm is. You're going to have your final plans with that signed cover sheet. You're going to have your bid proposal tool. And you're also going to have all of those executed easements by separate instruments at this time. So everything's going to be put into the electronic documentation package. We're going to take. So it's five days for the CFA process to get that CFA out and ready. And we're going to take five days for the electronic documentation package to just review, make sure everything looks good. Now, again, we're also going to be checking, is your insurance up to date at this time? Did you put in all of the notices that you need for your insurance and your workers' comp? Are you choosing pre-qualified contractors and are they still active? You know, we're not using one that expired two years ago. I also want to remind everybody that when you look at the agreement and the construction bond, so we're talking payment, performance, and maintenance, the agreement has to be executed on or before those construction bonds because you have to have an agreement in place to bond the work that you are agreed to do. So that's something we check. Make sure you do that on your side. I just wanted to remind everybody. Once we look at all of that, everything's good to move forward. We're gonna, that's when we're going to have that con record created, and we're going to take two days to move those items over to the con record, reach out to construction service, get an inspector set up, and then they will be reaching out with that uh, pre-construction meeting date. So I'm going to briefly kind of go over what we talked about. So pre-submittals, eight city days. This is 
seven days for review plus the eighth day for the conference. Submittals due by 12 p.m. every Tuesday. A technical review is going to be performed that same day. Comments to the applicant will be provided by p.m. no later than 2 p.m. the following Tuesday. Pre-submittal conferences will be held on Thursdays from 1 to 5. And you see there the option of in-person and virtual. Again, we can take more virtual. We can't take more in-person. First reviews, 14 calendar days. Submissions are going to be by 5 p.m. every Monday. Comments to the applicant will be provided by 1 p.m. on the 14th day. And then decision letters will be sent out by close of business. Compliance reviews. So it's going to be one city day for the PM review, that technical review we talked about, 14 days for compliance plus seven day option period. This is for compliance one. Uh, submittals will be accepted any day and time. City day, I think we all understand that one. PM will uh, have 24 hour review to accept or reject the submission. Comments to the applicant provided on the 14th day. Approval and disapproval letters will be sent on the 14th day. Corrections required will have a seven day option period and you will get your decision letter in seven days. Compliance is two and three. Exactly what we just saw under compliance uh, review one, except you're going to have seven day review versus 14. At this point, we should be getting to the nitty gritty of things. Looking at post plan approval, so cover sheet, we're going to take two days. Still going to be provided to the PM electronically, but everything's going through a cell at this point. CFA preparation package, we're going to take two days to look at those final CFA exhibits and the bid proposal that's been signed. Again, please check unit times unit price equals total. We don't want to have rounding errors as much as possible. Uh, cover sheet review and sign electronically. Uh, oh, I, that's a duplicate. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ex uh, we're going to remove that one. And then the CFA execution will take five days. Again, this is also the time we're going to be setting up the uh, construction fund accounts. So we're going to have that running. You're not, it's not going to see anything on your side, but because we're removing time after the electronic, we want to make sure we're being successful at that. And then the electronic documentation package, we're going to take five city days. There's a list of all the items that we're going to need under the electronic documentation. Um, this is also going to include that SWIP review and remember the construction permit acceptance is that SDS review. And then we're going to have construction package out. That's going to be two days. Again, internally moving everything to the con record, reaching out to construction services, letting them know something's ready and having an inspector um, chosen. So if we look at it, our House Bill 3167 was 68 city days to get through the process. Under legacy, not counting our pre submittal review, which is our eight city days, total city days for approval during the first review is 35 days. So you can make it through the process in 35 city days uh, if you get first review approval. If you go to compliance, let's say you have one compliance review, you're still looking at 52. Significant reduction from House Bill 3167. So looking at the rollout time frame, so Acela testing's in process. We've gone very close to everything. We're just getting those final checks taken care of. Um, we've already presented to city staff and DAC, uh, and we've already passed the last first review accepted for House Bill 3167. That was this Monday. So um, everything moving forward is going to be under legacy. Pre-submittal applications are currently open for those eight slots coming up. Um, and so today is our presentation to all of you. The first mandatory pre-submittal day will be April 2nd, so that's next Tuesday. That's the first day we're going to be looking and choosing the eight projects that come in first um, for those slots moving into Legacy. The first Legacy first review day is not going to be until April 22nd. This is going to allow us to go through two iterations of pre-submittals have projects ready for that first review. Hopefully, we'll kind of build a queue and have people ready to come in by that 22nd date. That's all I've got. I hope that was enough for you all. Um, we've got time for a break for 10 minutes, so we'll start back up at 930. But if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Just raise your hand since we are being recorded. We'll need you on the microphone so that you get picked up. So we got one right here. 
uh, wait for the microphone so everyone can hear you. Yeah, no problem. Vic's coming right now. Um, on, on the pre-submittals meeting that happened on the Thursday, you say that we, that we have possibilities of getting kicked. you have any idea when the notification, if you're going to make it or not, might come out? Because I get, I get comments on Tuesday, and then I, I might make my meeting on Thursday is how I understand it. So that. the only reason you would be kicked out once you've been accepted in those eight slots is if you haven't paid your fees. So as long as you paid your fees, you, you have a spot. Uh, I thought there was like only eight, and if there was just more. Right, so let's say you come in, so this is Tuesday before you've been accepted. So let's say everyone sure. came in on that Tuesday, and we had 10 projects come in. Right. The first eight, everything was right. They're ready to be picked up. You're going to be notified on that Tuesday that you didn't make those eight slots, but you are in queue for the next, the next round. One. So when you get your comments on that Tuesday, you say, hey, you can't make this Thursday. We're gonna, you're, you'll be the next Thursday. Yeah, right. So you'll be, yes, essentially you'll be in the queue for the next Tuesday when they do the reviews, but you're going to be at the top of the list. Okay, got it. I hope, I hope that it. made sense. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, when you mentioned new projects are going to be on the legacy, or are you considering new phases of a master plan community? A new project, or is that going to fall under the old house bill? No. So any new IPRC record will be a legacy process. Um, and then a question on, like, the SWIFTMA and having to have the final plat submitted and accepted for review. I imagine any kind of SWIFTMA requirements, is that also, from a plat perspective, only need to be submitted for review? Because I imagine that there could be some possibilities of easements changing that would be required for the SWIFTMA during the review site? Right. So, yeah, your, your SWIFTMA is going to be um, required for review during your plat. It just doesn't have to be, be a whole, so accepted it's, or, rec or re recorded yet, correct? Right. So it's something on our side, you know, we always allow plan approval without a SWIFTMA. It was something we checked before you went to construction. Mm -hmm. So SDS is still going to be keeping track of it. It's just no longer something we're going to keep track in the IPRC record because they are going to focus on it in the final plats. Sure. Um, and then last question, Has any? are there going to be any changes to early grading permits in that process? Not to my knowledge. Nothing that I've heard. I can definitely reach out to Leon and just confirm that there's no, no changes they're expecting um, and send that out to everybody. But to my knowledge, nothing's changing on okay. those. Thank you. Thanks for the information. This is very helpful. Uh, a couple of questions. When do you specify the preference for in-person or virtual on the pre-submittal conference? Yeah, so part of your application when you come into the pre-submittal, you're actually going to have a uh, selection feature there that you'll check in-person or virtual. On Excella? On Excella, okay. yes, sir. And then uh, you mentioned studies have to be approved except for drainage study prior to first IPRC submittal. Correct. This is more of a platting question, but uh, do all of your studies have to be submitted prior to a preliminary plat submittal, or can they come after your initial preliminary plat submittal? Yeah, so your preliminary plat's going to happen before you're coming into IPRC because right. we're moving towards that final plat, so your studies are not going to be set up at preliminary. That It's going to run the same way as it does right now, right? You don't have to have your studies to have your preliminary plat taken care of. So, But that is a great thing to bring up because I forgot to mention. So. If your final plat, let's say through IPRC, you need to modify your final plat. That's why it's submit to review and not accept it, right? If you have to modify your final plat, you need to go back and modify your preliminary. They have to match. So make sure that that's being taken care of during those, um, anytime you have to modify your final plat. Right. Well, did I, sorry, just to clarify, did I hear that correctly that your preliminary plat can be submitted to the platting group before all of the studies are submitted for the first submittal? Just to, just to chime in real quick, uh, Vic Tornero, Senior Capital Officer. Um, so on the platting requirements, we can take those comments from you guys, and we'll follow up with Stuart on that to give you a better response. Um, but generally speaking, when you do a preliminary plat, your study should be in place. Uh, but again, we'll get clarification for you guys yeah. on that and follow up on a, on a, on a correspondence. So.
quick question. Um, the technical review on uh, pre-submittals, um, you know, a lot of us have gray hair because of pre-submittal days when we get, you know, a list of uh, comments essentially the day of pre-submittal and we have, you know, 30 minutes to address them in order to get a spot in a pre-submittal conference. So are you looking more to see if the right items are there or, are you, you know, at times we've gotten comments on the plans as part of our pre-submittal technical review. So what does that look like now? Is it any different or? Yeah, so, and, and Jose is going to go over what he looks at during those technical reviews, but it's going to be, it's going to be an actual technical review. You, you may get comments based on that because we're going to talk about what we see as 100% construction plans for those pre-submittals. And we want to set you all up for success coming into those pre-submittals. So that's why he's going in and marking those things because they're items that uh, without being modified a lot of times they're going to cause more comments and you're not going to have a good plan review without those being accepted. So again, there are those eight slots. Be diligent when coming into these pre-submittals. Think of these pre-submittals as a, a review, right? We want these to be really well put together plans so that we can get you comments. Our hope is to get you through first review. So pre-submittal is kind of like your first one, first review. You've got everything cleaned. We're moving forward. But yeah, and, and Jose, again, will go through kind of everything he looks at during those technical reviews here. Okay, thank you. Can you clarify the seven-day option? Um, so it almost seems like to me it's like a conditional approval, and then you work with your PM for seven days or... Yeah, so you could you could think of it that way, but I didn't want to call it a conditional approval because that's not what we, it's not the same as what our conditional approval is under House Bill 3167, right? So essentially you come in, let's say you've, you've done all your studies, there's just some minor comments that need to be picked up. It's just, you're going to get your comments, let's say you submit it on Tuesday, in two weeks you're going to get your comments on Tuesday. And your PM is going to notify you, hey, there's corrections required, so I'm going to open this option period. Come talk to me. Let's, let's look at those comments. Let's get those addressed. As long as you can get them addressed by the following Tuesday, you're going to get an approval letter. If something pops up, something looked super easy and maybe it just wasn't, then you could get a disapproval letter after that option period. But the hope and the expectation is that option period is used to just wrap up the pieces that you need in your plans and get you approval without coming back in. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So correct me if I'm wrong, y'all are only accepting eight projects a week. Is that correct? Pre-submittal projects. Yes. So okay. eight pre-submittal, but that's not going to limit our first reviews and our compliances. Okay. So what happens in a project like ours where we have five IPRC numbers for the first phase? Yeah, I mean, again, pre submittal is going to be first come, first serve. So if okay. they all get submitted at the same time, they are have a likelihood of coming in together in those slots. But if you're piecing them out throughout the day, there may be separation in them. But again, the good part is we're going to weekly versus biweekly, which is under the house rule, so you don't have as much delay in getting those moved over. Okay. I mean, that's, in that certain instance, it's like one developer takes up 60% of your capacity in one week. I mean, that yeah. doesn't seem equitable. And yeah, and it's, again, the best way that we can be equitable is to come, it's first come, first serve. So if, if a developer gets those eight slots, if they get that week. But it's, it's, again, first come, first serve. Is there any plans in the near future to expand that capacity? Not in the foreseeable future because we have to be cognizant of the time that our PRT members and our PMs have. That's why we're trying to currently stick to the one to five. We're going to see, again, this is kind of a pilot process, right? We're going to see how things go. If we need to expand that, we can look at that. We're going to be listening to the development community. So just to, just to kind of elaborate on that too. So. You guys got to remember, we've got PRT members that are in PDCs, plotting, IPRC plan review. So that whole schedule is booked all week. So in the past, we've been asked to go back and evaluate that. We've done our best to try to make that accommodating to you guys. But with all the resources that we have, 
that's why we stuck to the eight, day, the eight submittals for one day. Shocked too when we heard how many uh, meetings you're going to have per week, right? And I asked this question at DAC. So that's 32 meetings a month. Mm -hmm. You're going to have how many projects currently do you have monthly that come in? So monthly for first reviews, because they're biweekly, so we, we have two rounds of first reviews. Currently we get about 8 to 12 projects each week. So we're looking at a max of 24 projects coming in right now. So you should be able to handle the current load? Yes. Um, are you guys still looking for sign and sealed sets on first submittal, or is that change into a pre-submittal, or when when do you guys want to see that? On yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we, um, and, and Tablish is actually going to go through all of those submittal requirements coming up, but uh, preliminary seals are going to be accepted on the pre-submittal and the first reviews. Final seals are going to be required for compliance. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. And guys, feel free to get some coffee, all of these things that look delicious that I have not had a chance to eat yet. So any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, guys. Okay. So we're going to continue with the presentation. I'm Tablisha Taylor. I'm the project coordinator for IPRC. Um, a lot of you may have seen my name over the years. You finally see my face. So... Good morning. I'm going to go over some highlights for the uh, Acela Citizen Access Application Updates. For pre-submittals under the new legacy um, process, or the revised, revamped legacy, the pre-submittal application so the deadline to submit is noon. Those deadlines are going to be hard deadline, guys. So please don't email me asking me at 12.01, can we get the project in? The answer is going to be no. OK? So uh, the deadline to submit is at, um, noon for every Tuesday. Uh, as it says here, the application is submitted after 10 AM, as you mentioned. Um, we're going to have quite a bit of pre-submittals, um, all things considered, from, from the previous legacy process. So we have to give ourselves time to do those technical reviews, OK? Um, and also, make sure that you do your due diligence. Please don't just submit to be submitting, because that's a waste of your time and ours, OK? I'm trying to do the technical reviews. Um, so no rushing. Even though the deadline is noon, we're advising everyone, Acela is web-based, submit as early as possible, okay? Submittals are every week, so that should give you at least a week to cross your T's and dot your I's as much as possible for us, please, okay? Now, um, deadline to submit is 12, but we're going to have to have a cutoff um, for 10 a.m., so which means that if you submit your project and we're going to review them in the order that they've been received, first come, first serve, okay? So if you submit your project to us um, prior to 10 a.m. on Tuesday, if there are corrections that need to be made, then you're going to have a chance to make those corrections because the deadline is not just for submittal, but it's also for getting those corrections into us as well, okay? So make sure that you keep an eye on your emails because that's going to be the way that we're going to communicate uh, with you guys via Acela, and if there's any additional detailed comments that we're gonna, we need to send out, we're gonna send you those emails. So keep an eye on your emails for submittal days for us, okay? And the people that are gonna be contacted are gonna be whomever you guys list as contacts in Acela, right? So if you're gonna be out, then your secondary, the secondary applicant and developer needs to be um, watching their emails, okay? Um, so 10 a.m. Now, that does not mean, again, you have up until 12 to, to do your submittals. But the difference between that is if you submit after 10 a.m., you're not going to be able to make corrections and still get in by the noon deadline. All right? So make sure that, you know, you do your due diligence as much as possible. We're, we're, um, for the public civil construction plan set, 
as the gentleman asked earlier, we're going back to the preliminary stamp, the preliminary seal. So it's not gonna be the engineering seals, okay? But what we need to be mindful of is whomever, um, if it's not just the um, primary civil engineer, let's say you have a, a, a architect doing the landscape and plans, right? We still need to have everybody's preliminary stamps on those cover sheets, okay? Those, that is um, professional guidelines, right? Um, we also need to make sure that we have either the recorded or accepted for review final plat or short plat, right? Um, which we went from final plat from the previous legacy to the draft under the control plan. We're no longer doing under the control plan. We're going back to plats, obviously. Well, the uh, final or short plats. We also need to make sure you have your plat notes, your general notes, all applicable design sheets, okay? Um, and all applicable city standard details. We need to make sure that the preliminary stamps are throughout the plan set. Okay, and we need to make sure that the project name is listed throughout the, the plan set as well. We have run into issues where they're, they're not, all right? And make sure that, your, uh, that the uh, plan set is flattened. The purposes of flattening the plan set is um, when we try to open up the document in a cellar, it errors out sometimes, it will not open up for us if it's too large. Okay, so make sure that you flatten the plan set. Also, we need your detailed checklist. And as Drew mentioned earlier, we're still holding to the $1,000 application fee. The application fee um, cannot be paid until the, uh, the project has been accepted and we've invoiced it, right? But you guys already know, you know that you're gonna be submitting your pre submitted application, so you know it's $1,000. So you can go ahead and prepare to make that payment, okay? Payments will be due by 4 p.m. on the submittal day. And um, if you're familiar with our emails, we're going to send you an email with the invoice and the payment instructions and things of that nature. Okay, which also lets you know that the project has been accepted. All right. To clarify um, what this gentleman asked earlier on the pre-submittal versus the submittal date and comments. So you submit your project on Tuesday. The following Tuesday, you're going to receive your comments. If the payment, when the payment is made, if the payment is made by that time, then you will have your Thursday meeting. If the payment is made, okay? What Drew was mentioning about um, being bumped to the, to the next following week, if you do not make your payment, you will not have your Thursday meeting, which means that the following week, if there is a slot, an extra slot available outside of the eight, then we're gonna add that project to the slot, granted that the payment has been made by then, so that you can go ahead and have your review. That's if there's a slot available. If not, then you're gonna basically be bumped from week to week if there's no slots available, okay? For the submittal, the project submittal, if you submit the example that Drew gave, we have eight slots. If we have 10 applications and eight people, uh, eight projects have come in, they've made their corrections on time, right? They're gonna get those eight slots, but the remaining two projects are gonna be added to the intake review uh, waiting list to be reviewed on the following week. Hopefully that clarifies your question, okay. So I didn't wanna go into too much detail on the ACA, but I know that um, we have some uh, new engineers that are coming in. Um, we are constantly getting getting questions and emails about how to submit. So I wanted to just hit some highlights. This is from the ACA side. This is on what the applicant would see when they're submitting the application. When you're looking for um, IPRC's application, you have to make sure that you're under the infrastructure tab. If you're not, you're not going to see our applications. Okay. And then you will click the carrot next to applications, do the drop down which will open up and it will show you all of the applications under their infrastructure division, okay? Um, so for the pre-submittals, you would select the IPRC pre-submittal conference request form, which will bring you here. This screen um, is actually showing you that there's six steps that you need to complete 
to submit your piece of metal application. All right. So, um, and these are the, the areas that you would see when you're, when you're going through the application itself and filling in all this information that is needed. As I mentioned earlier, um, the plans would need to be flattened. This uh, page is in a cellar is pending updates because we're going to provide or try to provide as many options. You see the links at the bottom as many options as we can to show, depending on what software you guys are using to put your plan set together, to show how to flatten those plans. Okay, so um, once you log into a cell, it's gonna look fairly different. But I do wanna point out that the required naming convention is not gonna change. We need to make sure that for pre-submittals that your, all of your attachments that you're uploading um, is prefixed with pre-sub as it shows here. And again, you will see this in the cellar as well, okay? To go over the first review, okay? Um, the deadline, uh, first review is gonna be every Tuesday. Deadline is 5 p.m. But similar to the pre-submittal, there's gonna be a cutoff point, which Everyone is familiar with our current, with our, well, previous deadline of 3 p.m. So we're gonna stick to that as our cutoff point, right? So our cutoff point is gonna be 3 p.m., which means that if you submit before 3 p.m., then you're gonna have a chance to make corrections by 5 p.m. deadline, right? If you submit after 3 p.m., between three and five, then your, uh, your project is probably gonna end up being reviewed the following, the, 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 uh, the next business morning, okay? Now, if we can get to the project, of course, we're gonna do our best to get to it before five o'clock, right? Um, but if not, depending on how many projects we come in, we have to give ourselves that little bit of flexibility, okay? Um, and so, you know, to review the project by the following morning. Either way, you're gonna get comments back from us if there's any corrections that need to be made, right? If there's not any questions that need to be made, but you submit it after 3 p.m., then as I mentioned, um, that's gonna put you guys on the uh, following review cycle, okay? That's if we do the, 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 the review um, for the next morning. Now, if there is not any corrections need to be made, of course, we will get you in on that cycle. But I'm meaning if you have corrections, then of course you're gonna have to bump you to the next cycle because you have to make those corrections, okay? Um, so the required submittals for first review, same thing similar to pre-submittals here. So there's really no need for me to go through everything that has not changed, okay? Um, but we will need your comment response file from your pre-submittal to be uploaded for your first review, okay? Um, next, as Drew uh, mentioned earlier, kind of re uh, reiterate at this point, so the studies are not required, obviously, for pre-submittals. For first review, the studies, will, uh, the required studies will need to be approved, and that must, have, must uh, be approved. In a seller in the new ACA application, you will have fields to input those study numbers. Please make sure that you that the formatting is correct. Every area has different formatting, so make sure that the formatting is correct because that's the way that a seller uh, relates those records. And we're gonna have to look at that when we do the intake processing to get the project accepted. So it's one of those help us help you situations, okay? So um, all of the studies will need to be approved except for the drainage study, which has to be submitted seven calendar days prior to the IPRC review. Again, but we still need to have that drainage record number so we can do a quick look to see when it's been submitted. All right. Any other applicable documentations um, that relates to your project? If it's a geotechnical report that's required, please make sure you provide that. If you've had previous, or this project has had previous off-site construction plans, we will need to have those as well. That's nothing, that's similar to what we have right now, right? Because we want our uh, review team and our project managers to know that there has been an off-site um, project that's connected to that on-site. So it really helps them out with plan review. 
and um, for any type of potential duplicate comments, obviously, we don't want to waste anybody's time. Yours are nor ours, okay? The um, plan review fee, again, once it's invoiced, right? Um, because we have the 5 p.m. deadline for first reviews, we're going to extend the deadline to submit your payments by noon the next business day. If that payment is not made by noon the next business day, um, you could be facing this project um, being pushed to the next submittal. Okay. We're well aware that there are some um, situations where the noon, the noon deadline cannot be adhered to. That would have to be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis, but we don't want to open it up to everybody, obviously. Okay. Um, so we're going to be looking at that on a case-by-case -case basis, and if we deem it necessary, then, you know, we can look at uh, other options at that point. The $387 per design sheet is not changing. Okay. So same, same thing here. Um, just to show how to submit for first review in, in ACA, make sure you're under, under the internship tab. Do the application drop-down. You're going to select... Infrastructure Plan Review Center application for first reviews. And these are the steps. You, uh, you're going to have about eight steps to follow to fully submit that application. Now, because pre-submittals are required, this screen here is going to be a hard lock. If you have not had a pre-submittal and you're not providing a pre-submittal number, you're not going to be able to submit your first review application. Okay. So you must make sure that you had a pre-submittal and it's going to ask you for the pre-submittal number and um, to let to allow you to move forward. Of course, as we mentioned, the naming conventions are not changing for first reviews. We need to have a pre uh, prefix with first subs, all attachments that you're uploading for your application. And again, this is also going to show under the first review application. Um, it's still pending because I we're providing additional links to show you how to flatten your plans. Now, for compliance reviews, the IPRC disapproval disapproval application is going away. There is no ACA application for compliance reviews. As Drew mentioned, everything is going to be uploaded under the parent record from here on out. Okay, so that means that there is no more R records. Right? I know that probably makes everybody happy. But we still need to maintain the same naming conventions as you guys should be familiar with for compliance reviews. If you're submitting, if it's a first, uh, first compliance or a first revised uh, submittal, make sure you have the Rev 1. If it's a second or third, which we hope that you're not going to have a second or third, right? We need to get you guys out as fast as you, as you would like for us to. But if you would, if you have to, then make sure there's Rev 2 and Rev 3 prefixed on all of your attachments. Um, for compliance review submittals, still not much has changed. It's going to change from what we have right now, but I want to hone in on some highlights, just some things that we've been kind of faced with um, in the past. Submittals are accepted every day for compliances, as Drew showed and mentioned earlier. The PM will have 24 hours to do their technical review to, to determine if they're going to accept the project or reject it. Uh, submissions made after noon on Fridays, weekends, or city holidays will not be reviewed until the next city day. So as Drew mentioned, you guys can upload over the weekend. They're not going to look at it until Monday. Okay. Required, uh, the required submittal documentation Similar to what everything else for the pre submittal and first reviews, the difference is that here we need to have the official preliminary seals and signatures. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, even if you have a landscaping architect, they're not engineers, but they still need to have their seals on the cover sheets if they have their seals anywhere throughout the construction plan set. Right, that's something that we have not been um, enforcing but we will be enforcing it full force here, okay? But similar as everything goes, the, uh, your plat notes, your general notes, your apl applicable design sheets, um, your applicable city standard details, make sure they're flattened. 
Here we provided um, information, as I mentioned earlier, for the professional seal and signatures throughout the plan set per whatever guidelines your professional license and seals fall under. So that's the civil engineer, the uh, landscape architect. Now, for, for non-city standard, uh, standard sheets or detail sheets, those would have to be sealed, okay? Which means that the next uh, section at the bottom for the detail sheets, we do have some engineers that are not comfortable with, with sealing detail sheets, and we fully understand that. And if that's the case, again, this is, it, this is the city's detail sheets, then I have an example of the verbiage that we need to, that you guys need to use on your cover sheets with the asterisks next to those that you guys um, are not officially saying is our, our design sheet or detail sheet or whatever. And we also need to have your comment response construction plan set from your previous plan review. I've said from the previous plan review, because if you're under a Rev 2, obviously that's going to be the, the comment response set from your Rev 1 submittal. Also additional uh, required documentation at this point, all studies should be approved, all studies, including the drainage, including any revised studies. Everything should be approved at this point. Any, any other applicable um, documentations, if you have to provide a supplemental ge geotech report or loan O's or permits agreements and things of that nature, we need to make sure that those also um, preface with the Rev 1s, Rev 2s, whatever, and upload it into a seller. The um, IPRC plan review, seat, review fees for compliance is an additional plan review fee, means that the only, the only sheets that need to be charged are the ones that were added to the current review uh, different from the previous review. And again, it's upon a, a project acceptance at that point. The payment um, is due no later than 12 p.m. the next business day, which is very similar to the first review. Um, projects, applications. Now, before I go into the ACA payments, I do want to note that post submittals are going away. So if you have, um, if you wanted to do a version of a post submittal, you would need to coordinate that with your project manager. Okay. Because we don't, if we have, when we have expressed CFAs and we have pre submittals, we're not going to have any slots available for post. So if you need uh, to have a meeting with the, with the project review team, the PRT, then you need to coordinate that with your IPRC project manager um, to have a separate outside meeting to clarify those comments, right? I want to make sure that everybody understands do not have a meeting outside of IPRC without including your IPRC project manager. That's um, opening a window for a whole bunch of confusion on your, on your project, which will end up being a waste of time. Okay? Getting to the ACA payments. For IPRC, the payment options are ACH, also called EFT. Some people call them E-checks, right? So I put all three there. Just so everybody will know, so I hope it's all one the same, different words, same thing. If you're paying um, ACH via a seller, electronically in a seller, and you're paying with a corporate or a business account, you might want to check with your financial institution to make sure that there's no ACH blocks. If there, if there are, provide them this 10-digit number, which essentially is not removing the ACA blocks from your bank account. It's only removing the ACA blocks from uh, City of Fort Worth's electronic payments. Because if it's a block, then that payment obviously is going to be declined. Right. The next option um, is bringing in a paper check in person. And again, when we accept the project, we're going to we're going to send you guys out the invoices uh, with the payment options. But to bring the check in in person um, down to the cashier's window, if there's going to be paid with a personal check, the payer or whose check that it is need to be um, available, need to be there in person, providing their photo ID. To the cashier's window. Now, big ticket item that everybody is constantly asking about, credit card payments. Credit card payments are still not going to be allowed for IPRC projects. The biggest reason is because, let's say for example, and we get a, um, 
most of the time we get a pretty big project. We get projects for like 100 you know, to 200 sheets. So if we're looking at, you know, the 3% that the, that the credit card um, system is going to charge times that 100 to 200 sheets, that's going to be pretty expensive. And I don't think your, your clients are going to want to pay <laughs> that much money just for, credit card, just for credit card payments. So we're not going to allow credit card payments for IPRC projects. Um, this is showing how, now I have two different, two, two different versions. This is going to be for the non-applicant. So let's say your developer or your developer representative wants to go in and uh, make the payment. They're not the one that submitted the application, so they're going to have to go through some additional steps. Make sure they're under the infrastructure. They're going to have to search the application by the IPRC record number that you guys are going to provide to them. Okay. Um, the record number and then a, a date range, because if they put in the wrong date range, then they can possibly say record now found, right? They're going to have to do um, in the middle, there's a payment drop down, do that payment drop down, select fees, and then they're going to see a screen that comes up across, uh, at the bottom as it shows here. To the right hand side, it says fees, uh, pay fees at this point. If you're the, if the applicant is going to be the ones paying, then you would have to, you know, just go to your dashboard under my records and you should see the list of your projects under uh, infrastructure here. To the right, you see where it says pay fees due, which will bring you to this screen, your checkout, check out again, and it's going to bring you here. We did three um, print screens from all three steps, right? So the right side is going to show you how it should look. If you do the drop down carrot under uh, the uh, app, I'm sorry, record type or account type, it's going to give you the checking and savings option. And then to the right hand side is showing you the example of the information you would be plugging in, which is the routing number and account number. Once you plug in that information, you're going to do pay at the bottom. You see the amount should be confirmed. Pay at the bottom. And um, from there, you should be able to print out your payment receipts. If not, then you can email us and we can send one out to you. Any questions? Okay. Jose, you're up. Alicia, we got a couple of questions. Uh, one quick question on the uh, IPRC credit card. You said you said because of the three percent fee is the reason that it's not accepted. Um, is it possible to do it and just provide the option of of the of the payee playing the three percent? Um, because I think that might be selected quite a bit as an option just for convenience. It's not an option for IPRCs. So when you go in for IPRC, make the payments. It's not going to be an option for that. And is the only reason the three percent charge? No, it's not the only reason. That's just the biggest reason. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's just the biggest reason. Okay. Uh, and just some feedback on that. I I don't think that three percent charge is really going to inhibit many people from using that as a convenience, though. So, uh, mm -hmm. it, it would it would change a lot from the perspective of getting it processed through, uh, from our side and getting that done. Thank you for that. I have a question about one of the other tabs, the water miscellaneous, um, uh, okay, more, under more, then you got the miscellaneous water. So sometimes if you're not submitting a big plan or you're doing infill projects, um, we get through the permitting process and then they say, oh, you need a plat, you need to plat this to get water and utilities to it, or they'll say um, you need to put in a miscellaneous water for in-house design. So. Are they going to be assigned? Uh, are those numbers going to correlate cause, uh, with uh, the permit number, like so that when it's ready to go um, and we start back routing it again, will it tie into these miscellaneous projects that will submit it or the permit that was submitted? In-house design is a total separate program from IPRC. There is honestly like no relation from, um, from those to IPRCs. So 
there, um, you were talking about, you talking about the tie-in with the studies? So uh, let, me, let me chime in on here. So on the miscellaneous projects requests, WMPs, those are separate from IPRC. There's times where we have requests that come in and say, hey, I want to do just my water and sewer taps through WMP, and they'll do the rest of the infrastructure through IPRC. We're trying to cut that down right now, but it's, it's two independent processes. But what we are, uh, when we get through the IPRC presentation, I'll give you guys a quick uh, overview of the SIP program that we're working on right now, and maybe that'll help, uh, you know, kind of put, to, put, you know, get you guys a better understanding as far as what's going to be coming down the pipeline. So. Um, I saw starting on the pre-submittal tab that it said recorded or accepted for review final plats or short plats mm -hmm. were needed is does that the accepted for review is that in reference to the technical review or is that something we need to coordinate with platting prior to pre-submittal that's um, platting so um for the platting process of course you know it can be pretty lengthy right yeah. and so um we're, we understand that a, a part of their process, they ha do have an accepted, for like the, once they have accepted your platting, your plat for review, then we're allowing that to be provided as a part of your uh, construction plan set. Okay, so does it go through like, I'm, I'm sorry, does it go through like multiple rounds of comments for the final plat prior to the accepted for review? Or is it just the once it's a complete plat? So uh, let me chime in on this one as well. Um, we've had some just conversations with the platting division, and initially what we were saying is uh, you have to have a final final plat, short plat with a with a uh, plat number on there. So in our discussions with with platting, what they want to do is make sure that that project has been accepted by the platting division in the queue. That way, it's it's an actual pr uh, plat that's under under review right now. So that's what we're wanting to make sure that. Uh, when we say accepted final plat or short plat, it's been accepted by the platting division, and it's under review. Because right now, they're still under the shot clock review, and we're just trying to make sure that we're respecting their 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 submittal requirements and deadlines on that. So that's why we're doing. That's why we we worked out with the platting division. Got it. Thanks. To kind of elaborate on that question, I noticed on the compliance review, it also still says, you know, the accepted for review final plat. Can you clarify when? The expectation is that it will be the fully recorded plat, and if that's needed for the compliance review, or later down the road. So just just remind, just be mindful on your CFAs. There's options for financial guarantees, right? So sometimes what people will do is they'll say, "Hey, we're doing a completion agreement for your financial guarantee." So that final plat will not be recorded at that time. So what we just want to make sure as you guys have coordinated with the platting division making sure it's been under review. Again, like they've mentioned before, during any review process, that if those plats are modified, you guys are gonna have to go back and get an updated one before you come back to IPRC. So that's why we're just trying to make sure it's consistent all the way through the process. And one thing I will note is, so we actually talk to platting to understand what their workflows call out as you work through. So when you look at your platting, it will say in review. And that's why we're using that language, set accept it in review. So as long as you have that in review on your plat and you have your plat number, you shouldn't have a problem coming in. Sorry, just be mindful. We're just trying to make sure terminology is being consistent across the board with all the divisions because we understand that that's caused some confusion in the past and that was we're trying to make sure we're consistent across the board. So, um, and, and unless someone's got one that's you know, needs to be asked right now. We will have another break after Jose finishes talking. So um, just want to be cognizant on time. So if y'all don't mind, we'll move forward with Jose's and then we'll have questions for both Tablicia and Jose during that break. Hello everyone. My name is Jose Mendez Vargas. I am the engineering tech and I'm going to go ahead and go over our technical reviews and what I'm looking for. Uh, first, we want to make sure you guys understand what a hundred construction plan set um, looks like. 
So the basic required components that we're looking for is gonna make sure you have a cover sheet, final plat with plat number, general notes, water, sanitary sewer, grading, erosion control, drainage pavement, street, pedestrian light plans, traffic and uh, construction details, whichever is applicable for your project, of course. Uh, only include public improvements unless uh, private utilities um, are gonna be crossing the infrastructure, uh, then those have to be shown on your plans. Uh, construction plans submitted should uh, reflect the items checked in the detailed checklist. Uh, so general comments, uh, make sure the uh, construction standards are October 6th of 2023. As mentioned before, a recorded plat or accepted for review plat uh, is required. And also please make sure that accepted final plat uh, must comply with the approved preliminary plat. And at the end of it all, just make sure that your, uh, your plans are, are flattened. Uh, also just uh, take note, grading plans are now required for all public water, sanitary sewer and drainage improvements. Now this is a copy of the cover page. Now this is where I will start my review to begin with, uh, just to let you guys know that make sure the construction standards are up there. Make sure that this is the cover page you guys are using. If it's not, then that's something that you'll get an email from me um, if it's not correct. Um, just make sure you have the maps go, um, make sure you have the council district and make sure you add in the middle that image of where the location uh, it's gonna be. That way we know where the project um, uh, is gonna be located. Just make sure you also update your components. If you're only doing water sewer, just make sure you only have water sewer up there and you also have your project name. All right, so let's start with the water plan uh, technical review. So what I'm looking for is a list of all that I'm looking for. Uh, just make sure existing and proposed fire hydrants uh, are there and the coverage as well. Uh, show all gas storm drain utility crossings um, to ensure all connection points are labeled and provide detailed information when connecting to a smaller, uh, smaller water line size. So basically what I'm looking for is just making sure, for example, 12 by 12 T uh, with reducers, or if you're gonna be going to a smaller um, uh, water line, just MJ solid sleeves and spool piece. So I wanna see that on your plans uh, when you submit them to us. Uh, show location of proposed gate valves and services in profile. Label all isolation valves throughout the entire project. Uh, gate valves are required on all fire lanes and domestic services above three uh, inches and three inches water, uh, water lines are not allowed. Uh, T's have gate valves attached to them, shall be labeled as anchor T and need minimum three foot separation between water main and gas, uh, gas line or whichever uh, lines they are crossing. Uh, just make sure to coordinate with each utility in required to confirm clearance uh, requirement. Um, moving on, uh, this is also what I'm gonna be uh, checking for water plans. All water sewer crossings need to comply with the TCEQ Chapter 217, make sure to call out TP elevations and not flow line elevations for the water lines. Uh, specify the intersections of uh, the cleaning uh, wise and pigs. And the city of Fort Worth uh, does not allow four inch gate, excuse me, gate valves. Uh, water service uh, lines cannot be located in pro uh, proposed driveway approach. Some of these are gonna be uh, mentioned and repeated again throughout the other uh, plans that, we, that I'm gonna go over. Just make sure that nothing's on the driveway approach. Uh, curved water mains are not allowed, though minor deflections and bends may be acceptable. Uh, provide a fully constructed embedment and backfill uh, detail for all water improvements. Uh, contour all required to be sh uh, contoured to be shown where there are water mains located outside paved areas. Uh, and finally, provide a water sampling table, which is, here's an example of what that looks like. So that's what I'm looking for when I'm looking at the water uh, plants. As long as you have that, um, you won't get an email from me. All right, so moving over to the sanitary sewer. Uh, four inch sanitary sewer services are not allowed to connect directly to the manholes. Uh, sanitary sewer services are not allowed to be located in driveway approach, like I mentioned. Um, just don't have anything on the approaches. Uh, make sure to indicate a 100 year water surface elevation provide a planning profile for all sanitary sewer mains on a single page. Uh, show parallel storm drains in profiles, sewer manholes are not to be constructed at the end of the lines when there are sewer services connecting to the main. Uh, provide dimensions um, to ensure that there's five feet separation between OD to OD between proposed storm drain and manholes and provide a fully constructed embedment 
again, backfill detail, uh, this time for sanitary sewer. So this is a lot of things that will be repeated. Uh, it's just part of um, each uh, set of plans that I'm going to be reviewing. Again, curver, um, curved sanitary sewer lines are not allowed. Uh, horizontal or vertical changes should be made at manhole. And contour, of course, required to be shown when sanitary sewer mains are located outside the paved areas. Uh, continued on to the other set of um, sanitary sewers. So show all public, private, gas storm drain, utility crossings. Um, all sanitary sewer lines shall match uh, soffit to soffit. Uh, when installing manholes, a manhole epoxy liner should be provided uh, in the following conditions. So drop manholes, slope 3% uh, or greater, require downstream manhole to be epoxy lined, and of course hydraulic uh, slides are install installed. Excuse me. Uh, trench water stop should uh, be provided when the following conditions occur. So downstream of any stone drain or water main crossing, and slopes of 3% or greater require a trench water stop uh, on the upstream side of the manhole. Uh, moving on to the storm drain plans, provide hydraulic computation tables for proposed public storm drains and inlet. Uh, please show plan and profile for all storm drain mains on one page. Uh, show 100 year in profile. Uh, show all water sewer utility crossings. Provide all head water and tail water data in profile. And again, this is just a list of everything that I'm going to be looking at. Um, like I said, just as long as you have this on your on your plans, then you won't get an email from me. Uh, also, as we can continue to provide dimensions to ensure that there are five foot um, separation between proposed storm drain and sanitary sewer lines, manholes. Uh, in regards to manhole intervals, not to exceed 550 feet for pipes 54 inches or less, for pipes 60 inches or greater, equivalent size box will be a maximum interval. Uh, it's going to be 800 feet. Uh, show existing proposed grades on upstream and downstream sides of the culvert, uh, and grade to drain is not allowed. Uh, provide a fully constructed embedment and backfill detail for uh, storm drain improvements, and the minimum storm drain main size is going to be 24 inches. Pretty exciting stuff. So moving on to paving, uh, when repairing concrete pavement, uh, it is important to provide a plan and profile. Uh, ensure that utility pavement repair comply with a City of Fort Worth 2019 utility cut policy. Uh, make sure that a minimum street grade is going to be 0.50%. Uh, in regards to cul-de-sac or elbow gutters, it's going to be 70%. Uh, when changes in the grid occur, the following criteria should be adhered to. Vertical curves, and we have there the... Example of what you need. Uh, moving on to street light, uh, show all conduit runs for proposed street and pedestrian light improvements on one sheet. Include standard uh, City of Fort Worth street light tables, uh, show location of proposed water sewer mains and services to ensure there are no conflicts. It's just a way for me to make sure that no fire hydrant is in the way when you guys are uh, doing your street lights. Um, other than that, um, we have a break for 10 minutes, unless you guys have any questions for me or Tablisha. Before we get started on the QA, I just want to clarify one thing Mr. Wells brought up earlier on the plat. I know we had recorded final plat and uh, uh, final plat accepted. So if you're not replatting the property, make sure you have a recorded final plat in the plan set. So that's why I want to make sure I just clarified on that. So all construction plans have got to have a final plat in there, one way or the other. Just kind of a generic process question. Um, I, I, I get the, the pre-submittal meeting, you know, and again, the pre-submittal package is pretty, like, full construction plans, like, everything. Um, what, what is the, I don't know, the, the, the process of, oh, here's my concept plan, I want to go to the city of Fort Worth, and then kind of just have, walking the developer through, like most cities have, like a pre-development meeting? You know, is you, am I, is that ringing any bells where you're like, oh yeah, this part of the this part of the development is going to be a grading permit? Then like these driveways will be uh, an express IPR. So, you know, where the city kind of walks the development team through kind of what they expect, or this will take a rezoning type of thing. You know, so you just don't submit for first sum or the pre-submittal, and you're like, oh, this isn't zoned residential. You know, I mean, obviously that's incumbent on, you know us to figure out in some way, shape, or form, but it, it, where's, where's that?
process in this? It, I'm just talking about for development in general. I, 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 I come, to, I, I've got 40 acres and I want to build some apartments, but I've never done work in Fort Worth at all. So usually you'd submit a concept plan to some city and they would say, we'll come on in and we'll do a quick 20 minute breakdown of what the process is and what you're going to do. Like it, that, that's, that's what a lot of development or, or developers would expect just so they have some sort of safety net to fall back on. I'm like, cool. We went all the way down through full construction plans. And then now I'm being told that, you know, I have to rezone the property or a thoroughfare, you know, has just been, you know, figured out to come right through the middle of the property. You know what I'm saying? Like just yeah. something. So uh, we do have pre-development conferences that can be asked for through the facilitation office. Uh, we also have separate uh, drainage PDCs that can be set up. Since drainage is typically pretty right. challenging, they, they'll set up their own time because that takes a little more time. They will be at the other PDCs. But yes, those are uh, set up through the facilitation office, and okay. that's something you can do prior to coming into IPRC. Okay, so there's pre-submittal, which is what we talked about today. Yes. Pre-development. Yes. And then pre-development storm. Correct. Got it. And, and basically just, you know, everything will always start with a PDC. That's, that's, your, that's your starting point. Pre-development conference meetings, set that up with facilitation. That way they rope in all the troops into those meetings. You hear from all those different departments. That way you can get all the feedback before you guys come see us. Yeah, Usually due diligence periods are like 60 days. So what, what is, did, do you all know, can you all estimate, I submit for one of those, I can get in in a month or anything else? What we can do is we can we can reach out to Tony uh, Rutigliano, uh, who's the interim manager right now, and we can get that information for you as far as what's timing-wise, how long it takes to get a PDC scheduled and items like that. So, Drew, I meant to ask this question earlier. Um, pre pre submittal pre conferences are obviously great because all city staff is there and you can ask questions. Uh, first reviews and after that is the plan of action going forward if you have questions for specific reviewers, street lights, storm, whatever, is the best point of action to still go through the city PM to set up a meeting? How do we how do we best go about that? Yeah, so going forward, and, and just like it should be right now, your PM is your point of contact from the moment you have that pre-submittal. So anytime that you need to have communications with those PR team members, uh, go through your PM. That being said, if you want to CC that PR team member so that they're aware that this is coming down the chute, I, I don't have any problems with that. But make sure you're coordinating through your PM. Your PM needs to be in all of those meetings because your PM is going to be doing that technical review when it comes to compliance. If you have a discussion with drainage and you resolve their comments, but that PM doesn't know that, they could reject you because they weren't part of that decision. So we just need to make sure everything goes through your PM. Any other questions? All right, gang. Well, it is 1024, so let's take a 10-minute break. If you want to get some food, get some coffee, go to the restroom, and then we'll pick it back up with water and sewer city cost participation. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. So thanks, Drew, for letting me hijack your presentation. Um, so we're going to talk today about water development cost participation. We do also have a TPW component uh, that we're not prepared uh, for today, but water is what I'm going to talk about. My name is Melissa Harris, and I'm so excited that I got to meet a lot of you guys because we always see each other in the squares on the screen, right? So this is so nice that I actually get to see faces. This is so cool. Um, so we're going to jump right into it, guys. You all have probably heard this spill multiple times, so I'm just going to go through it really briefly. When cost participation is used is uh, typically for water main oversizing, uh, city facility oversizing, and the um, risk-based assessment, which is the uh, cast iron initiative that we have. Uh, this is kind of small. Again, this presentation is going to be available to you um, really soon. I'm sure it's going to be posted on the IPRC. Again, these, for, these are the formulas that we use to calculate uh, our cost sharing uh, I basically took this out of our ordinance. Um, so we have typically the oversizing, 
if you are oversized, if we're asking for an oversized 16 inch for water, 18 inch for sewer and under, we participate in, I can barely see this. Um, so the participation is gonna equal the cost of the main provided, uh, meaning for example, if we ask you to oversize to a 16 and you, your development needs an eight, then it's going to be the 16 subtract the eight, the cost difference is what we're going to participate in. Uh, I'd like to point out for those, for that scenario, um, there's typically items that a 16 inch would require that a 12 inch wouldn't. Uh, for example, air release valves and blow off valves, we are responsible 100% for those items. So, um, and then also plan sheets, uh, 12 inch uh, and below don't require profiles. So uh, that's also a fee that we could participate on as well. Uh, for the water mains that are greater than 16 in water and greater than 18 in sewer, there is a percentage that's calculated by the WPD group. And that is already set up when the study is approved. Um, so again, it's going to be the capacity provided minus required divided by provided. I know that's, um, and that's met uh, the WPD group that handles that for us. And that is during term sheets, but we'll go over that in a, in the next slide over. Uh, and then the next is the risk base, which is the cast iron initiative. This is where no capacity increase uh, is taking place. We pay 100% uh, when additional capacity is not required to serve the development. So I know some of you guys will do some infield um, uh, development where maybe there is a six inch line, but you need a six inch fire line. Well, that um, development would require an oversizing based on your needs, so that we would not participate in. But if you needed a tap, uh, or if you're paving over that line when we know it needs to be replaced, then we'll take that 100%. Um, and I say 100%, and again, we have to go by the ordinance and the unit prices. So it, in actuality, if you're going private versus public, makes a huge difference, and I have slides to show what that looks like. Okay, so private versus public. These are just kind of some uh, big ticket items that I would say public big means that I can use the unit prices that are awarded from that contractor. Uh, the financial guarantees are, ex are all accepted except for the completion agreement. Um, again, the lowest responsible bidder is awarded by the consultant and that's during the, um, all through the bonfire software and then you also have a panel uh, that you're with with city staff and you guys who, uh, come to that conclusion of awarding that bid. And of course, MNCs uh, are presented after the bid when it's public bid, if it's over 100K in, which it typically is, um, in funds. The private bid, this is where it gets really sticky and where we have to work a lot together uh, to finally come to this unit prices that we use are the lowest from the unit prices and the awarded bidder's price. Uh, and that's based off of the ordinance a developer bond is required in most cases. I believe the only case, and I'll highlight in a minute here uh, on the financial guarantee handout when it's not required, but a developer bond typically is required that covers both developer and city costs. Uh, and then again, the developer and the consultant, you guys work together to, uh, we're in the, in the background whenever you guys, or you're in the background doing all of your um, uh, awarding of bids when it's private bid, we're completely out of that process. Um, the one thing that we do on an MNC, we're allowed to go ahead instead of waiting for your final bid tab because the unit prices only allow for me to give reimbursement up to city unit prices. So um, I can go to council already ahead. So you'll see me a lot going before you actually are down to that signed bid uh, phase. I can go ahead of time and kind of get funding set up so that we're not holding you up too, too much. The benefits for city participation for the city, of course, they're taking advantage of the construction mobilization, allowing for a faster delivery of the public infrastructure. Fort Worth is growing too fast, so fast we can't keep up. You guys know that. Uh, increase the, uh, the extent of the capacity of the public infrastructure beyond what the developer is responsible for constructing. Uh, replace and improve existing public infrastructure that's deficient or is deteriorating in a deteriorating condition. For the developer, it allows you to proceed with your anticipated uh, timelines, which are more aggressive, obviously, than the city's timeline uh, for, the for the future public improvements. 
Um, it provides more resilient infrastructure for your development to connect, reducing possible outages and traffic disruptions. Uh, it also provides the needed capacity for any future growth um, phases and expansion in or around your development. Uh, some of the main requirements, obviously, if you are exceeding in 100,000 in city participation, not in your overall project, but in city funding, an MNC is required. A MBE goal is required for any funding exceeding 1 million. And again, that is city participation, not your total. This is the, uh, and probably most of you may still have this handout. This is the one that I would give out most. Uh, and I'm only going to touch on the over 50K, but I do want to highlight in that under 3,000, that is when, um, or sorry, not under, yeah, under 3,000, the number one says that it's any financial guarantee for a public or private. I mentioned earlier that developer bonds for private bid are always required. That's the only instance when it's not, and I've yet to see an under 3,000 contract. So I'm just going to highlight over 50K because that's the one we typically deal with. Uh, public bid, there's no hubs required, um, but you, the financial guarantees as well are any except completion agreement. Private bid, no hubs as well, but the developer bond is uh, required for city and developer costs. City participation um, for, for non-oversizing, let me stress that, non-oversizing, so that's cast iron initiative, that's replacements of sewer lines that are uh, deteriorating as well. We are... Um, we are, we are unable to reimburse past 30% on that project, um, and that's only for private bids. So this is where, for an example, we have a replacement that needs to be done, but your improvements on the IPR set is maybe just water, and we need to replace a water line. Well, if that's the only improvement there, then we obviously aren't going to be able to reimburse the 100%, right, like we say because we're only maxed at 30% by state law. So some of these projects have been pushed to public bid so that you can get as much funding from us as possible. So public bid is always the way to go if you want the most of the city dollars. Uh, and this is like really small. And again, this is more of a timeline that you uh, have to see like what happens in the background for me. Uh, these are a couple of touch points. This is pre-IPRC, okay? So this is beforehand. Uh, when we identify this, uh, the participation projects, uh, typically during study, however, there are times when uh, they're caught at uh, PDC, like you mentioned before. Sometimes PDCs will identify that. Uh, sometimes it is an IPRC first to middle because we didn't realize there was a line that is from 1910 or something like that. So unfortunately, that does happen, which I'm excited that pre-submittal is now into play because this is where we can catch a lot of that. So I feel like we'll be able to uh, walk alongside you even better, uh, I think, with that touch point there. Um, and of course, we have internal staff meetings, and then we uh, push that out to invite you guys out. And then we use the term sheet as a, a discussion point. And that, the term sheet is really what's going to drive the project. It's going to show the responsibility of the developer versus the city and the expectations for both of us. The term sheet is really what helps uh, keep us uh, moving it forward. Um, I'm not going to really go into detail for DPA. If, if you're in here, most of you guys already know design procurement agreements um, and the MNCs for funding for that happened before PR, uh, IPRC. Um, so that is in here. And also, if you have a design procurement agreement or you have large mains that we're participating in, there's a auxiliary review that we like to do and that's uh, a courtesy to you so that when you do submit for IPRC that you have minimal comments to address at that time. Uh, so again, we're kind of doubling now we have the pre-sub. So I think I don't see any reason why we can't have, uh, Drew, like you said, it was just one that went through. I, I think this new process, we may have more uh, that come in. Uh, so then we have when our auxiliary review is done, uh, I get the DPA MNC ready, and then we execute DPAs. Of course, this is right before IPRC. So this is steps during IPRC. What happens there? Uh, I take a look at the plan sheets, look at the scope of work. I come up with a cost shared table. I use your quantity takeoffs for the whole project. I basically uh, take out all the all the items that apply to the scope. Uh, we enter that um, calculations, unit prices. Um, 
and we come up with a table. And, and of course, we just kind of go back and forth until we get the quantities right uh, and the items right. During the bidding process, so this is the important decisions that really drive the directions we're going is, does your developer want to go private bid? Do they want to go public bid? All right, those are the really biggest, and, and what drives that too is what kind of financial guarantees are they wanting to use? So that's really the, the two really biggest decisions that kind of drive the direction that we go and how we can go to MNC as quick as possible. Um, now, of course, only if it's a, over 100 and K. Um, so then we have, once we get MNCs ready, um, we do the pre-preparation um, for like the CFA execution. So this is us getting tables over to the uh, contract management office. And let me go right into the next slide because this kind of gives us, uh, we're going to talk about public bid and what that looks like. So I won't go over every document on this list here, but this is the public bid checklist. I only want to point out the bottom, which is the equity goal. When we do have an equity goal assigned, there is a few steps, not for, well, for both of us, right? But for me internally, I have to coordinate that with the MBE, the diversity and inclusion group. Um, and then we kind of work together to get um, all of those documents needed for them to give us a goal. Um, so I just want to point that out, that that, that does add uh, a little bit more. Uh, so this is a big announcement. Some of you may not know, I, um, we, we just realized that, I'm going to show you this real quick, the, the equity goal now requires three weeks of advertisement. So that's something really big that you guys probably didn't know. Um, we typically had two weeks for our public bid projects, but if you have an equity goal, we're required to do three weeks. So again, these calendars are going to be in the slides, so for your reference. Uh, bonfire is something that went into play in January, and I think uh, we only had like maybe one or two that go through and still kind of working out some bugs. Uh, but so we're trying to get up with technology, and this is an online um, platform. So for bidding, all questions, plan downloads, and submissions go through this bonfire uh, software and answers to the questions that were provided either during the pre-bid conference or through a SELA uh, will be provided by an addendum. Uh, for the actual bid opening, the opening still is in these council chambers. No paper bids are accepted. Everything is done electronically through bonfire. The bidder name and the total bid cost is read out loud during the opening. Uh, it is evaluated for the lowest responsible bidder. It'll be performed through uh, Bonfire, and it's done with a panel of city staff along with you guys. Um, and of course, the developer or consultant uh, is uh, the one to notify the winning bidder. Uh, MNC timeline. So this is really important for you guys, right? Well, for both of us, because we're trying to meet deadlines. I'm going to just go forward a bit for with the uh, MNC council date. I just wanted to bring your attention. I wish, I think there's a red thing on here, right? Yeah, this routing date here, that's the dates we're looking for. Those are the cutoffs. So I'm just going to point out, I need at least two weeks. So if your bid was open and it's awarded, I need two weeks from this routing date. So these are really important to coordinate and we really try our best to um, give you a milestone timeline, starting to do that up front as, as, uh, as much as possible so that we can try and hit your deadlines. You have deadlines, I have deadlines, and so I, I appreciate you guys working with me. Uh, I want to remind you that council dates, unfortunately, they're subject to change, modified, canceled, outside of our control. Uh, so just so you guys know, the, these are the dates we're trying to shoot for here. Um, before I end my part, I'd like to touch on ch change orders. Uh, change orders uh, require MNC when they're over 100K cumulative from that very first contract amount that, um, that council approved. Um, so again, if it's cumulative over 100, so that's decrease, increase, 100,000, 100, uh, an MNC does have to be um, executed again for any changes. Uh, so change orders that do require um, whether the city is changing. Uh, so for example, you have a change order and it's paving or it's water and you had sewer um, city participation. We still take a look at that cost share table. As you see now, that cost share table shows developer cost, city cost, and total. So it's going to uh, also be uh, relevant on the, on the uh, change orders. That same table is going to say developer, city, um, and total, just so that we make sure that our contract amount 
is very uh, transparent throughout the construction. And so when, when we do have change orders, uh, they are signed by the sponsoring department, legal, our uh, assistant city manager, and it's recorded by the city secretary office. Uh, and then probably the biggest um, takeaway I wanted to say about change orders is that if there are any uh, limitations, meaning like the unit price uh, differences, if the cost increase past those limitations, the delta is paid for by the developer. And lastly, when are we going to get our money? So typically, reimbursement is done at green sheet. Now, of course, the reimbursement's already negotiated in the term sheet, right? So that discussion would have been done well before this time. Uh, so typically, it is green sheet. Um, it is also detailed in the CFA contract. And if you have a design procurement agreement, it is the design services fees is detailed in the design procurement agreement. Uh, one really important thing, please have your developers uh, register through the purchasing division, division online. We want to um, eliminate as much delays in receiving payments. One thing I didn't put on here uh, is payments, uh, reimbursements can be check or can be ACH. We do recommend ACH because processing is done three times a week as opposed to one time for a check a week. So just kind of plant that in the developers if they, if they want their funds quicker, ACH is uh, the best route to go. And now we have our updates and overview by Drew. Thanks for your time. We'll do Q&A after Drew finishes up. Yes, thank you, Melissa. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm running now. <clears throat> and I just want to press one point that Melissa had on those change orders. So again, change orders are cumulative. So if you have a change order one for 60000 and the next one is 40000 you got to go to M&C. So it's each, it's not a change order over 100000 It's a cumulative effect when we have to go to M&C. So... I'm not going to read everything in here. A lot of this information I just wanted to make sure we had in the slide so that it was available to everyone here. So we're going to just quickly talk about the standard CFA exhibits. Um, we have one change to those exhibits. I know everyone loved having C1, C2, Z, X, Y, Z. No one, no one knew what the lettering was. So we've gone ahead and said, OK, location map. And then exhibit A is water, exhibit B, sewer, C is paving, D is storm drain, E is street lights and sign improvements, so still combined, but under E. And then F, we're adding in that traffic signal and striping improvement. So making it a lot more easy to follow. Um, this is getting implemented under legacy, so any project coming under legacy needs to follow these exhibit lettering. Um, I'm not going to go full into this, but, you know, over the last few years, I mean, we're talking five plus years, there's been a lot of discussion on what needs to be in those CFA exhibits. And between the city and the development community, it was decided they just need to be stick figures. We need to, we need to outline, you know, the basic uh, infrastructure that's being put in. Uh, so all exhibits require the owner developer information consulting engineering firm information, the city project number, and that's important because if the exhibits get separated, we want to make sure they get put back together, uh, legend scales, and the line work. Additional items like pressure planes, pipe abandonment, various uh, pavement thicknesses, all of that, we don't need to see that in the exhibits. Um, but a big note is please note that all infrastructure that you are connecting to that is not construction needs to be labeled as not existing infrastructure and provides the development phase name and the CPN on the exhibit. This matters even if the project's in construction. If the project hasn't been green sheeted and the infrastructure moved over to the city, it's still considered non-existing uh, non infrastructure. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to go through each one of these unless y'all just like to hear me drag on, but I did want to make sure that y'all had the information on each one of these exhibits. So um, we'll have the location map, exhibit A, B, C, D, E, F. 
So all the information that you need to provide for each one of those have been outlined here. Please use those as your reference as you're getting those CFA exhibits pulled. You shouldn't have any problems from us. Um, so I want to touch on phased and concurrent CFAs. I, there's no changes to phase and concurrent CFAs as part of legacy. Just kind of want to do a brief overview because a lot of people have questions on that. So a phase CFA is where a single developer is responsible for a multi-phase project in which a parent project or the first project in the sequence provides connections to both above and below ground infrastructure to a child project. I think we all understand what phase is. Developers coming in, phasing out those components, but everything is owned by that developer. Concurrent CFAs are when multiple developers are required to work together to provide infrastructure uh, delivery to each other. So we have got neighboring communities. One is putting in a uh, sanitary sooner that the other one needs to connect. They've made an agreement that they're going to work together on that. That's a concurrent CFA. So for phase CFAs, the developer must acknowledge that they and all parties contracted under them uh, under them in the CFA understand that they are proceeding at risk and absolving the city from that risk. All forms of financial guarantee are allowed to be used in phase scenarios. All easements necessary for all infrastructure uh, construction must be obtained and filed prior to the project's pre-construction meeting. So we need to make sure that all easements, you know, easements by separate instruments, things like that have been taken care of before the project goes to construction. In single family projects, phase B, the child project, can obtain a recorded plat, but, uh, or cannot, thank you, I was like, that doesn't make sense, cannot obtain a recorded plat, but can obtain an executed CFA to construct related public infrastructure. And then in construction projects, uh, plats should be recorded with a hold placed on the building permits and the certificate of occupancy will not be granted until the CFA infrastructure has been accepted. Concurrent CFA, so the parent project, we're going to call developer A, must have a project that has reached compliance prior to the child project submitting constructions to IPRC pre-submittal. So we need to make sure that we're having that time frame so that this is all working out in a good um, time so that infrastructure from A can be in place before B comes online. Developer A will enter into a standard CFA, which will now contain language absolving the city on any of their phase projects. Developer B will need to submit to the city at first review of the IPRC plans notification via the IPRC checklist, the CFA application, uh, that there's notification that this is going to be a child project and we'll be connecting to future and unaccepted infrastructure. Again, we also want to see this on the CFA exhibits. Make sure you're talking that this is non-existing uh, infrastructure. Completion agreements are not allowed for parent or child projects of concurrent CFAs. If a developer uh, subsequently wants to be added, but there is not an agreement from the previous developers, that developer must wait on acceptance prior to starting infrastructure. So A and B coming in at the same time, they've decided to work together, they're coming in. C says, well, you're coming in, I want to do that on my property, and A and B have already moved through the process and they're not trying, wanting to connect with C. C's got to wait till A and B is in place and the uh, infrastructure has been accepted before they can move forward. Uh, so we're going to touch on some other updates. So these are things, like I said, that are on the horizon. We are not um, bringing them up yet, but I want to make sure everybody saw them now. So IPRC calendar and the revised web page, both of those have been uploaded, so the revised web page is here. You can find the calendar there. That's also where we're going to put the presentation. And we're going to be adding a lot of the information um, based on legacy and all of the discussions we've had today there. So that's something that we're going to continue to upgrade, continue to provide um, information. We're going to work on the creation of the new Express CFA record. Express CFA is not changing, but as many of y'all know, they currently use the workflow 
that we have for the standard. And so you get a lot of conflicting notifications that don't make sense for the Express CFA. We needed time to roll out a legacy, so we wanted to start with that, get y'all um, moving on legacy first, but now we're gonna take a step back and say, okay, let's get Express CFA running exactly how it is, make sure you're not getting 40 notifications that you don't need to know about. Um, so that's on our horizon here. A street closure request, this is something we're looking into more and making sure the PM has an understanding of when those street closures are happening. Uh, make sure that we're getting all the information to you guys. If there's a street closure longer than 10 days, MNC is required. We need to make sure that y'all understand that because it could change how you do your construction or your delays if we need to make an, an alternative route, things like that. Um, so we're trying to make sure we have a full understanding of that process and then we're gonna get that out to you guys. Uh, standardized construction product submittals. So this is something that We've been working on it for a few years and it kind of got put onto the back burner, but we're bringing it back up because we know it takes a lot of energy for those contractors to pull all of our product submittals together, especially when they're using pre-approved products. We don't need those full submittal lists when we're using pre-approved products. So we're trying to standardize what needs to be provided to the city, what process we use for substitution across the board and how we review uh, not just water, sewer, storm, but TPW components like paving and uh, street lights um, and storm. So we're working on getting a system for that. Again, we don't have anything in place right now. Right now we're continuing with submit those. The PM will review and provide any comments that are needed. Um, but we're hoping to get this standardized, cut the time that the contractor has to get these pulled together. Also create a way that we have an exact list of what products were put into each product or into each project. Um, the next thing is the release of construction bonds. So we're talking about the payment, performance, and maintenance bonds. Currently those are held by the contractor or the consultant. Um, I know in the past, the city actually had those paper bonds with the seals. So we're in discussions on legally who needs to be holding on to those, how we release thing, them, things like that. And finally, we're also looking at certificate of appropriateness uh, that may be required for submittals when pedestrian lights are required in design districts and MU projects. Uh, this is something that would benefit us as well as y'all. Um, we don't want to get into a situation where everything moves forward and then you have a hold for zoning requirements or for pedestrian that wasn't caught during the IPRC by adding the certificate of appropriateness or work us having some mechanism to work with zoning so we know when that's required. It's going to allow us to make sure that all of those um, items are put into the infrastructure plan and we're not having to have change orders or anything like that. It's also going to let us know when zoning has uh, waived those. So in a lot of cases you may come in, you got a waiver um, because it just didn't make sense where you were at, right? You have one street light in the middle of a road that has no other street lights. Uh, we need to know when that gets waived so that we're not providing comments that they're required and making you put something in that you don't need. Uh, so, you know, here's all of our contact information. So again, I'm Andrew Goodman. That's my uh, contact. I also go by Drew. Either one is fine. Just know Andy and we're in good spirits. Um, we have Tablisha Taylor back here and Jose as well. And then here's all the information for our uh, project man uh, manager. So if you need to reach out to them, that's all their contact. I will note Isildeen is our newest one. He's been with us for about three weeks, so he's gonna be taking on a lot of my older projects. So if you see his name pop up, that's who he is. Uh, we'll make sure to make introductions whenever y'all swing by City Hall again. Uh, and we're working on filling our last vacancy there. So we're in interviews this week, actually. And then here's the contact for Melissa. If y'all have any questions about city participation for the water and sewer lines, uh, she is a great resource as well as pretty much everything else in the city. <laughs> um, so with that, we've got questions. Anybody feeling like the panda? Is this just the worst experience you've ever had in your life and you want to chat about it? That's me a lot of 
Uh, don't feel like a panda, but um, the two questions from Melissa. Um, on the unit rates that are in the ordinance, the 2019 unit rates, is there any plan to update those? Absolutely. It's under review at this moment. Okay. Any expected timeline on that? Three I months, six months, expected, a year? No. Okay. I don't have an expected time for the next one. Okay. Just know it's actively being looked at right now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, second question is on the cost participation. Um, does cost participation uh, include any portion of the design cost, a uh, proportional share of the design cost or anything like that? It can, and that'll be negotiated at the term sheet. Okay, great. Yeah. One other thing I wanted to point out, um, Isabel Sierra, who's sitting right behind me, will also be uh, taking part in projects for city participation, so she will also be a, a really good resource. A uh, couple questions, thank you all. Um, one, um, when is the MAPSCO requirement gonna go away since most of my engineers don't even know what that is? Um, uh, not really, but kind of serious. Um, the next one is on the phased CFA. Um, is there a, a straightforward way to morph a project that is once was a phased um, CFA project and let's say that parent project reaches green sheet you know, well before, sometime before the child project, you know, is, is finished. And so theoretically, it's no longer a phased project in the sense where the parent project is fully accepted and has green sheets. Is that just a CFA amendment at that point that you go through the contract uh, through, um, you know, Julie and Rebecca's group to do that um, so that you can release some of those, sure. you know, the kind of conditions, conditions from that. that we have yeah. in there. Yeah, so uh, to touch base on MAPSCO, I understand that there's some archaic components, but a lot of uh, state uh, entities still use it, like TxDOT, and so when uh, our transportation engineer, Chuck, is looking at it and wants to make sure that he's doing the street use um, correct, he uses a lot of those MAPSCO. So we're going to keep MAPSCO for now. Um, hopefully a new system will arise and people will start getting some of these things that are a little outdated out of the way and we'll be able to revise that. Um, but as of now, APSCO is here to stay. Um, the other question for what you're talking about on a, a phase, the phase language within the CFA, yeah. So if you, let's say you had two projects that were originally phased, the second one gets delayed uh, either kind of pauses in IPRC or whatever the situation, and the first one gets green sheeted. So if that second one hasn't gone through CFA, then there's not language that's needed. If we get to the point where this one has been completed and we need to reevaluate the language within the CFA, that would be a CFA amendment at that time. And yes, you would go through the contract management office for that. Uh, just make sure Again, any time that you're dealing with changes to the CFA, your PAM is cc That way they're aware of those changes as well. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to turn it over to Vic. Okay. So uh, I've been hearing chatter as far as what does Vic do around City Hall now? <laughs> he was over IPRC. He was over DSWS. He's got multiple hats, so uh, just to let you guys know, I'm the Senior Capital Officer, pro Projects Officer for the, for the Development Services, so uh, I'm over IPRC, but Drew is the Engineering Manager, so feel free to reach out to him. If you can't reach out to him, then you can reach out to me. And then I'm also over this new uh, SIP program. Have you guys heard anything about it? Okay. So I'm going to touch briefly on it. We're going to have some upcoming... Uh, uh, seminars. Uh, we're looking at doing a Dev 101 in the next couple of months, and we'll elaborate a little bit more on the SIP program. But with the SIP program, you guys have always heard, you know, miscellaneous projects is taking too long. How do I get these small scale infrastructure projects built? So the program is going to be water sewer paving drainage. On the drainage, it's going to be minor drainage improvements, extension of inlets, laterals, so on and so forth. It's going to be the same criteria that's outlined for the express CFA. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can always refer back to the CFA policy on that. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is next week, we're going to be rolling, rolling out phase zero. 
Phase zero is only going to be related to pedestrian lights. Any flat work that may come up, we'll look at that. Um, ideally, we're, you know, we've got five design engineers that are going to be help us, helping us out with the designs right now. Uh, so you guys will submit the request to us. We're going to evaluate just to make sure it fits the criteria for, for SIP program. And again, I'm sorry, SIP program stands for Small Scale Infrastructure Projects. Customer service with a, with a cup of tea, let's put it that way. Um, so with the program, again, uh, we've been asked to accelerate it because we've had a lot of uh, pedestrians, uh, pedestrian lights that need to be installed for small scale projects. So eventually, once we get fully staffed, we're going to be built doing everything in-house design. So you guys come to us, provide you know whatever the scope is. We'll do the design. We'll have a pre-qualified contractor on board. So all you guys would have to do is give us a, give us a design, or give us your proposal. We'll do the design, provide the estimate. You guys got to pay for all the fees that are required for uh, the project. So. Uh, we will give you an estimate. Uh, until you guys pay that estimate, just like a WMP, we're not going to go to construction. This is a self-sustaining funding uh, program, funded 100% by the development community, by the developer. There's no city cost participation. Nothing, nothing from the city is involved on this pro on this program. So, uh, phase again, phase zero is going to be the ped lights and any incidental flat work, driveways. We can work with you guys on that. Uh, phase two is going to be, uh, we're going to be scaling up uh, to potentially doing water and sewer uh, extensions, uh, taps, so on and so forth. So eventually, like I said, we'll be taking on a lot of the uh, minor infrastructure. Uh, so there'll be somewhere down the road where we will, you guys will no longer be required to do a WMP. Those requests will be uh, housed under my, under my new team. So. Jenna Anderson is the program manager for the SIP program. You can reach out to her. If you can't get a hold of her, you can always reach out to me. So just want to touch base with you on the new program that's going to be coming out pretty soon. And uh, again, we'll go into full, full detail uh, in our next uh, Dev 101, which I think will be in the next couple of months from what I've been told. So um, that being stated, appreciate all the uh, attendees in person, everybody that's on virtual. I uh, hope the information today that we, everybody from Development Services provided to you was useful. And uh, if there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and conclude the uh, seminar. All right. Have a good day. Yeah. Thank you all so much.